Euh, un très ancien collier de directeur de Ibru, l'Institut de la Fondation de la Fondation International Relations. Uh, we're very proud to uh, all co-organize this conference with the uh, European Chair on Sustainable Development uh, of Sciences Po. And it's my uh, great pleasure and honor to open this uh, high-level political session at the end of the conference on how to advance planetary governance for a sustainable future with a specific focus on what can be expected from Europe or what is expected from Europe. And, and I'm really extremely grateful and honored uh, to welcome Senora Ministra Teresa Rivera Rodriguez, uh, Vice President of the Government of Spain, Minister for Ecological Transition and the Demographic Challenge. Again, I'm extremely grateful uh, to Teresa, uh, under whose leadership we had the honor and pleasure uh, to work when she was the director of IDRI, uh, that she takes the time uh, to, uh, in, particularly in these extremely busy schedule, uh, in the midst of the challenges of the just transition pathways at national scale. I know how complicated uh, politics are in Europe in general on this subject and, and in Spain in particular in this moment. Uh, and really that you can give us your vision of how these national efforts need uh, a step forward in global governance and multilateralism to make transformation and sus to sustainability and prosperity a reality on the ground. Uh, Teresa, Senora Ministra, you have been a key personality in international uh, climate negotiations with a clear acknowledgement by all parties of your capacities to build bridges for cooperation between the southern and northern countries. I think of Cancun uh, 20, 2011 on adaptation. I think of uh, COP25 uh, in Madrid, uh, organized in Madrid for and with uh, the Chi Chilean presidency. I, I also want to stress how much in EU negotiations your role at the Environment Council of Ministers is really acknowledged as uh, well known uh, to, to be able to construct ambitious environmental negotiations outcomes. Um, uh, and, and I think that's really an experience uh, that, that is very useful for when we think of multilateral decision making. I don't speak of what you've achieved in Spain, also negotiating with civil society and private sector uh, to phase out coal. So your experience, your position now is extremely important for us, Madame la Ministre, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sebastian. It is a great pleasure for me to, to join you in this occasion. I think that 20 years is a long time. Um, working to clarify some of the critical aspects in the transformation. And my first comment could be that um, we are experiencing as far as, um, as, as, far as we uh, transform our um, uh, systems, how difficult the transformation is and how many new things we discover along the pathway. To a certain extent, we, we need to adopt uh, some, uh, how to say, soothing mantras to, to remind ourselves of what we need to do. So we talk about build back better, an agenda for the recovery, leave no one behind, the agenda 2030 is brought to inclusion, so understanding and underlying the importance of inclusion or natural positive solutions as an act to reaffirm the need to reconcile with nature. And I think that this is more or less um, what it is um, in, the, in the screen in the horizon some of the three main pillars that uh, do pose um, different challenges in the, in the global governance. Inclusion, fairness, equity, a, um, a responsible manner to, to balance um, the, uh, the human needs uh, with uh, the ecosystem limits and to, to transform, to deeply transform the understanding of prosperity and, and development. And um, along the last years, it's true that the last months, we, it's true that we have had some additional difficulties, the, the impact of the um, pandemics, the, um, the sense of vulnerability, global, global simultan simultaneous vulnerability shows uh, to what extent uh, um, uh, we are still lacking a, uh, a good and performing uh, governance model, even if uh, it may um, has also been useful to, to, to improve uh, some of the, the needs and to identify some of the, the, the black holes that, that we need to, to comply. At the same time, we, we have uh, witnessed to what extent uh, this type of crisis still widen inequalities, still miss a proper answer to environmental and climate emergencies. And I would say that at the same time show and this is something that has happened related to the pandemics, but uh, just after the pandemics, when talking about the recovery, it is still the case 
to what extent we are still missing a, a new type of coordination. If we are all going to do the same things, if we are going to uh, demand the same goods, um, at the same time and in a very short time, um, we are really not prepared for that. Uh, the global value chains do not work anymore uh, to provide this type of uh, response. This creates new stressing points, the new bottlenecks, and eventually um, new points of uh, conflict. So also from that perspective, how we can um, speed to, to respond properly to this, um, to this new type of challenges um, is an important issue to, to, to wonder, to find a proper response on what type of governance we need to put in place uh, and what type of challenges we need to, to face um, and to respond in common. Um, so I think that um, that this is something that it is already floating in the air. Uh, this is something that uh, deserves uh, a, a very important attention from from all our brains. And at the same time, we discovered that um, it is not just a, 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 the inequality questions are not just an issue from a given point to another given point, but also in the transitional times how we can uh, facilitate a uh, much more proper uh, um, conciliation of the um, of the time frames uh, for facing in uh, new models and facing out new models or for um, providing um, proper changes in the um, in the demand side uh, when the offer side um, is uh, has been has been changing also quite uh, quite quickly Certainly, dealing with um, fossil fuels, we are already experiencing that all over the world, but not only. I think that there are many things that uh, do need to encompass that are not still still there. So, how to effectively transition into a new paradigm and how to manage this transition in a fair manner? Uh, I think that the main um, theoretical receipts um, are already identified building social resilience, building multilateral governance, uh, how we can get into, into that is, is part of uh, the agenda of this anniversary of IDRI, and it is uh, certainly part of your day-to-day -day, um, work, your core work um, as an institution with um, all the, the, the team that, uh, that uh, works in, in IDRI. Um, but you are now asking something very concrete. To what extent Europe uh, needs to play differently? To what extent um, it is possible to ask Europe to play differently, or to what extent Europe has started to play in a different manner. Um, and I think that um, this is this is interesting because even if um, we are still missing many things, particularly in terms of speed, flexibility, or capacity to to, to, to respond in a day-to-day -day basis to, to the changes and unexpected circumstances that can come, I think that Europe has already. Uh, understood that uh, it is important to change and it is taking greater steps uh, forward. I think that uh, we have seen it uh, uh, when identifying decisions that uh, were not thinkable, not so, so far so far ago. You know, the, the idea that prosperity equals to a certain extent green deal or uh, the 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 proper way to update the economy and the productive systems or the importance of solidarity uh, at the domestic, um, and when I mean domestic now, I refer to the European dimension uh, level is uh, is something that uh, was not so clear and was not so widely accepted so far ago, and, and it is happening, even as I say, still with many question marks that do not have a proper answer. Even in the external dimension, um, things are changing. Uh, how Europe uh, perceives uh, itself in a, in a much more balanced manner towards different um, uh, partners in, in different regions and what, uh, to what extent it is important also to identify and, team and, to, and to build on uh, its, its own um, personality while uh, being much more empathetic uh, to, to the needs and the, and the demands uh, from other partners, so to, to build back better together. I think that uh, this is this is very this is very interesting, and we need to to develop um, and to draw all the conclusions that can come from that from that perspective. I, I would say that um, in a very simplified manner, uh, um, Europe needs to confirm what is uh, how we see ourselves. Uh, uh, 
and our role at the at the global level at the multilateral scale in different uh, in different agendas and how the different agendas need to be connected or at least personally consistent uh, among each other how to build bridges how to build alliance um, and then from my perspective i think that this issue of potential bottlenecks in the global value chains and how to reconcile the different aspects dealing with that should be an interesting field of, um, of work for, for Europe, um, taking into consideration that to a certain extent we are always on the side of those demanding more than providing, but at the same time those being much more vulnerable because of uh, the lack of understanding that uh, the provisions um, are not for uh, are not to be taken for granted. So I think that this is an interesting perspective. Uh, raw materials, different goods, uh, um, uh, services, natural-based uh, services are things that uh, will be are already demanded. We can talk about natural gas, but we can talk about batteries or lithium or whatever. Um, but uh, as I say, at the same time, uh, we also understand that uh, what uh, it may be the, the values and the prospects for many other partners in the world uh, um, are the same ones than ourselves. So how we can combine, how we can call for a much more uh, constructive dialogue on how to deal with these tensions to avoid uh, um, the risk of derailing some of the transformations uh, that are already ongoing. I think that um, this understanding uh, needs to be based on a much more clear international solidarity. So to develop the empathy to take into consideration what are the weak points, uh, what are the fears of um, some of our colleagues. We have seen this uh, dealing with the vaccines, we can see it dealing with the climate impacts and the resilience, we can see it dealing with the food security and so on and so on. So I think that peace, security uh, and the environmental connected risk, uh, the health risks are things that um, are, are important and as, are much more advanced um, at the, uh, at the, uh, at the discussion of the theoretical point and can be a, a good reference to, to be taken into consideration. In fact, uh, the whole uh, Build Back Better package, the Green Deal uh, and the, uh, the increase of the ambition connected to the 55 or the, um, the, the biodiversity, the maritime agendas, so that uh, this, this is, uh, this is um, a portfolio uh, of um, potential um, uh, opportunities uh, for, for building bridges and for uh, building a, a common future with, uh, with many, many other colleagues. So the substance, the, the points of um, discussion and, and, and the points of, um, of uh, substantial change to be taken into consideration when building this, uh, this uh, global governance are already there. Um, then I could say that uh, the other point where uh, there is a strong role to be played by Europe uh, connected to this, uh, to this change is uh, the distributional effects of the transition. The, um, the transition and the final result of the transition. When we talk about climate uh, change, we understand that there may be different impacts in terms of uh, the climate effects um, and the climate policies to be uh, pushed so to, to fight against the, the sources of um, greenhouse gas emission. But we also understand that there are a, um, the risk of inequalities in the transitional times, um, both at the domestic and the international level within the same generation. So I think that we have already gone through this type of experiences in many of our countries. And I think that this is interesting because this is, this is not easy. This is not easy to deal with. And um, either we have some credible and trustful um, opportunities to build uh, alternatives or uh, this is, this is uh, something that uh, will drive us into, into a clash. So paying attention to the social dimension of the transformation and the equity aspects in this, in this um, agenda is very important and still, even if uh, there are many countries in the world that are going through a similar experience, I think that this is an agenda where Europe could learn and could uh, provide good basis for the dialogue and, and, and common, common action. And, and I think that this, this could be a very credible win-win uh, alternative. Um, this connects with another uh, main pillar in the sustainability agenda, 
uh, which is the circular economy. So connecting back to this idea of good goods, uh, how, how to ensure uh, the access to these goods on, a, on, a equity, on an equity basis and how to avoid uh, conflicts for this, for this access or to avoid volatility um, in terms of prices, so impacting in the most vulnerable disease of the, of the population. I think that um, this is something that is still, uh, still needs to be much more developed. It, it connects to other very attractive agendas, so those agendas of innovation, technology, economic opportunities, business opportunities, these things that always sound very attractive. Um, uh, at the end, we know that uh, not because they are attractive, they are easy to handle or to push forward. Um, and as I say, uh, probably anticipating where the risky points, the, the difficult points may be, is very, very important. Another relevant issue uh, when talking about the European perspective and how to build this um, new uh, global governance pattern uh, could be what about the diplomacy? how to work with the diplomacy. And we have been working on that for ages. It is very impressive to, 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 to think back on how long we have tried to build a green diplomacy or a, uh, I would say different colors diplomacy. So a green diplomacy, a blue diplomacy, a white diplomacy. Um, and uh, and at, at the same time, uh, um, we should be asking why uh, it is so difficult to change the terms of reference to have it in a, in a much more mainstream manner, and how in the bilateral, bi-regional, or multilateral agendas we can perform that. A third point where I think that um, it is important to be, I would say, a, um, a, uh, innovative and, uh, and, and, uh, and I would not like to say uh, the word aggressive, but I mean audacious probably, uh, is a, um, how fast we can reconcile the idea of um, not wasting resources and investing in proper development. Something that was already in the preamble of language of the Paris Agreement, uh, how to ensure that 100% of um, the financial flows are fully uh, climate consistent, uh, and it is still there uh, on the air, uh, but it, it, it goes beyond climate. Um, and we know that it is still a very difficult to identify the negative social impacts of certain investments, uh, investment decisions, or how to learn how to do things better, how to improve the transparency, of how the financial flows work, and how to, how to ensure that um, the, the finance, which at the end is instrumental, works to, perform, to allow people to perform better, to, to, to provide prosperity and not to, to to push um, inequalities. I think that this is also a very important topic. If we take into consideration how much um, it represents Europe in terms of financial flows, um, it is wealthy and um, uh, big enough uh, to be much more uh, consistent and much more aligned when, when, when uh, uh, taking decisions in a conscious manner on the impacts both at the domestic level, but also at the international level. So I think that this is also important because global governance is not just um, stating how to do, but doing. So this idea of leading by example or building together, all these mantras, as I said, are very important in the in the step by step and, um, and, and factual and, and real, and real uh, or uh, walk in the path and not just um, stating things. Then it's true that there are very interesting experiences dealing with uh, green bonds, dealing with um, transparency and learning to account on what type of taxonomy, full of contradictions sometimes, difficult sometimes, but I think that it is it is worth it to, to take some, to draw some lessons from this idea and to, to share and to and to and to build together with, with other colleagues. This um, this is also important in the trade in the trade um, agenda, uh, which is going through a, um, how to say, a very interesting crisis in terms of um, what type of uh, trade agenda, uh, what does this mean, this, this idea of a carbon border adjustments, which is already in the agenda, not only at the European level, but also at the, at the uh, trade organization, or uh, what does this mean in terms of 
aligning and ensuring that the different agendas go along together in a, in a, consistent, in a consistent manner. Uh, both to facilitate what we need to, to do, so going back to my idea, how we can ensure that um, the global value chains are reasonably organized to, to avoid clashes on how we electrify, decarbonize, or provide uh, services, uh, basic services all over the world according to the new parameters of sustainability. So facilitate these, these aspects and facilitate the governance of the tricky issues dealing with these aspects, but, but also to provide the right signals in positive and negative senses to, to ensure a consistent approach at the different, at the different level. Um, I think that um, Idri has very interesting experience of some of these uh, pieces. So what does this mean in, in global supply chains? such as palm oil or, or cacao or tuna or, or soy, but um, and how this impacts in the, in the biodiversity losses in different places of the world. But uh, we customers uh, do not even uh, take, uh, pay attention to the fact that we are harming uh, people somewhere else far away. So I think that learning and providing transparency on the real cost of all of this and providing alternatives is, is also important, even more if we are introducing new references in the, in the, in the trade, um, trade uh, chains. Um, finally, I think that um, the dimension of um, the leave no one behind in the, in the international development agenda is very important. So what about uh, development beyond EU borders? Uh, how to deal with um, the scarce uh, natural resources, the capacities to, to, to build development, the capacities to build security and to, and to build uh, security in all its dimensions and to, to ensure prosperity all over the world? And what is the role of Europe in that, in that context? I think that... Um, uh, there are aspects that are still uh, tricky, not only in the agenda of the, the traditional agenda of uh, development, uh, both from the uh, perspective of the Euro perspective or, the, or the, um, the African perspective or Latin America or Asian perspective, but also which, which are shifting, but, but need to be worked a little bit better, how much can be built um, according to each one's um, own uh, capacities and how cooperation to provide better development and, and not just through uh, financial means but, uh, but to, to ensure a proper uh, basic um, software uh, together with the hardware uh, to provide development is important but also at the at the same time still uh, tricky issues uh, what about uh, this, this transboundary uh, impacts that uh, deal with, um, with big uh, crisis and, and, and cost, climate cost, uh, human, human flows, so uh, migration and, and refugees dealing to different um, inequalities, including the impacts of environmental crisis, um, or uh, how to anticipate uh, proper solutions and proper ways to cooperate to, to resolve these this aspects dealing with uh, human, human societies um, in, a, in a planet that is uh, constrained and subject to, to different, to different uh, crises and, and effects. So I think that um, this is not something that uh, can be solved by Europe on its own. In fact, it is something that cannot be solved by anyone on its own. But I think that these are issues that, that deserve um, a very strong political energy and a very wise uh, brain, brain, brain energy. So thinking on um, different uh, um, um, questions that may be difficult in an anticipated manner and providing uh, innovative manners to, to deal with, uh, with these, uh, with these uh, files, with these, with these agendas. Um, and um, as I said, my impression is that um, today Europe is a better place than three years ago, than, than five years ago, um, is still far away from being perfect. It's still impossible to be done with uh, no uh, good and committed partners, um, both uh, internally and externally. But um, at the same time, my reading is that uh, 
there is a very deep understanding, I would say, all over the world uh, through the difficult experience that we have been going through uh, in the last two years uh, about this um, also very topical, uh, typical mantra, uh, we are all on the same boat, so much better to work together along the same uh, lines, even with um, different approaches to, to, to achieve, to reach the same, the same goals. Uh, and those would be my comments, Sebastian. A pleasure to see you all again, even if it is on the screen and not in person. Thank you so much, Teresa, for these very uh, useful words for launching this uh, final discussion. And uh, thank you very much for taking the time. Um, I, I, I will leave you to uh, the rest of your uh, many uh, issues uh, on your desk today. Uh, we are immensely grateful that you give us a direction and have uh, led us to understand what are the next uh, steps on which Europe could build on finance, on development, on trade. Uh, these are issues that we have discussed before. Thank you so much, Teresa. I, I will now hand the, thank you very much. I will hand the floor to uh, Professor Dan Esti uh, from the Yale Law School of the Environment to facilitate the next uh, panel. Uh, Dan is, uh, Professor Esti is, uh, is uh, one of the prominent experts of global governance in particular concerning the environment. I just want to remind the participants that some of the speakers will speak in French. We uh, managed to have only consecutive uh, translation. So for those of you who don't speak French, please be patient. The interpreter will interpret consecutively. Uh, and I remind the, the, the speakers that it's important for them when they speak in French to uh, wait for the translator and make uh, regular uh, pauses so that the translator can come in. Then the floor is yours for one hour. Sebastian, thank you so very much. Uh, and let me just start by saying Congratulations to you, uh, Idri's celebration uh, of so many years of contribution to global thinking is really worthy of, uh, of mention, and I congratulate you and the entire Idri team. It really is uh, a great joy. Now, are we going to translate, simultaneously translate me as well? Do I need to pause? Not at all. It's only the French that is going to be Okay, so thank you. You can speak in English uh, without, uh, without any... So I want to welcome all of you to uh, our conversation now bearing down on the idea of a new and green deal for our planet. Thinking in particular about the entry points uh, for that kind of a deal into the global conversations that are underway and how we ensure that the transformative change that will be required is done on a basis that's sustainable and inclusive. And I want to just start by saying uh, that we are at a critical moment. We might even say a watershed moment for the planet. Uh, we have the climate negotiations in Glasgow, so-called so COP26, just weeks away. We are in fact just a month and a bit beyond the release from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change of its latest assessment report, uh, so-called AR6, which really tells us that the planetary boundaries that we've been watching and worrying about for some time are ever closer and the need for action ever greater. And we have, if we needed to be, uh, further reminded in uh, the last year and a half of our profound interdependence, interdependence across the planet by the pandemic and by the recognition that when we all suffer, uh, when any suffer, we all suffer. And the challenge now of building back better is one that we share across all nations, but are not facing equal challenges. In fact, another of the lessons of the last year and a bit has been the profound inequality that exists across the world, which itself is an obstacle to progress and frankly is a threat to what I call the need for a recognition of the sustainability imperative. The idea that we all need to be focused on sustainability as a foundation for 21st century society and most profoundly, a recognition that sustainability needs to be a core principle for the framework that we build for our 21st century economy. And this requires a work across nations like we've never seen before. And that really is the challenge that we all face now. And I'm very impressed by the topic that we've all been discussing for the last several days of trying to think about a, a new structure of planetary cooperation, of global governance at an unprecedented scale. 
So I, I think we are, again, very much aware, uh, and if anyone was not aware, the, the fires and floods of recent months in many countries across the world are a reminder that we do need transformative change. We need deep decarbonization, and we need to really relay the energy foundation of our society uh, with an expectation of deep decarbonization with a net zero goal for greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 being a common target. But how we all get there and get there together remains uh, very much in question. And I think that is um, the issue for our panel today. How do we deliver the kind of change required? Recognizing, and I know we've got uh, a former prime minister who's gonna help us think about this, but knowing that change is always difficult. Uh, people are jarred by change, worried about it, and fearful that their lives coming out the other side will not be better, but might be more crimped, might be more confined. Uh, and I think that is really the big issue here. How do we make the change required inclusive and make sure that the most vulnerable are brought along? And we do know that there's starting to be pathways to uh, the change emerging. I've been part of a team in the United States that's developed something called America's Zero Carbon Action Plan. And this ZCAP, as we call it, lays out on a quite detailed basis what will be required across six critical sectors. So we know that the pathways are emerging, but I also wanna tell you the bottom line of that study is that we see a way to about 80% of the emissions reductions required uh, for deep decarbonization for net zero emissions by 2050. But we also know, and this is really the core of my comments today, uh, that three things are gonna be required to make this happen not just in one country, but in all countries. First is innovation. We don't have all the pictures uh, of the pathways we need. We have a need for technology breakthroughs, for uh, better renewable energy in particular, for supporting technologies of batteries and storage, but we also need innovation in policy. We need new frameworks to encourage the kind of creativity and entrepreneurial spirit that we know is out there across the world, but not always steered towards the problem solving that we've now identified with this sustainability imperative. So we do know we need a creative and innovative policy. We also need, as Teresa just told us, uh, innovation in finance. We're gonna need to flow a lot of capital out across the world, not just in the developed world, to ensure that we rebuild the energy foundation all across the world. And that will require new partnerships. And frankly, I think it requires innovation in global governance. We need to innovate in how we ensure alignment uh, between goals like a net zero greenhouse gas world in 2050 and the structure of our multilateral development banks, or even perhaps more importantly, and again, Teresa just mentioned this, uh, our trading system. How do we ensure that the rules and processes of the WTO, the World Trade Organization, ensure continued progress toward deep decarbonization rather than in some ways incentivizing behavior that makes that project more difficult? So I think there is a real need for innovation as a key element of how we think about future global governance. The second thing I would say, and I'm working on this in my own team at Yale, is I think we need a new kind of core set of principles around what that engagement across countries is gonna look like and how we will all work together. Principles in particular for our economic interactions and for how our market economy is gonna work. And my own focus is on the idea, and this is in the language of economists, that there should be no uninternalized externalities, no spillovers of harm, no pollution, no other environmental damage done by any one business to any other entity or any other people. And we should insist on minimizing environmental damage. And to the extent there is some residual that is unavoidable, make people pay for it in full. So again, innovation in the core principles that kind of guide us as we work together. And finally, and this is part of our conversation today, and I hope our panelists who I'm about to call on will talk to this issue. I think there is a need for leadership. Uh, my own experience in looking out and studying global governance for decades is that change and particularly movement towards big goals requires leadership. And I do think this is uh, an important role for Europe. There is a lot of capacity there to lead the world towards new modes of cooperation, new ways to integrate 
uh, our agendas and ensure that we're all moving forward together. Uh, there's value in Europe's front running status on issues like climate change. But I think we've also heard over the last few days, and I want to highlight that there is also going to need to be uh, more work done to disseminate best practices, to share what's working, frankly, to identify what's not working and pull back on it. But I think we also need to ensure, and uh, I would highlight this, that it's not just talk, but action. And that, again, is where I think uh, European leadership could be possible. So with that, I want to turn to our three panelists, an outstanding set of perspectives that they promised to offer us. And I'm going to begin with uh, Jérémy Petit from the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And he is leading uh, the work on the Alliance for Multilateralism. Uh, Jérémy. Mesdames et Messieurs, uh, je vous remercie. Uh, J'aimerais uh, remercier les, les organisateurs pour avoir organisé cette session sur uh, la gouvernance. J'aimerais vous parler donc de l'alliance multilatéralisme, un sujet sur lequel j'ai le plaisir de travailler depuis plus de deux ans au sein du ministère des Affaires étrangères. L'alliance pour le multilatéralisme donc a été lancée en 2019 suite à la prise de conscience de défis croissants auxquels le système multilatéral est confronté. Ces défis sont de trois natures. Il s'agit tout d'abord d'un manque de moyens qui est lié à un manque d'engagement des États dans le système multilatéral, par ailleurs à des interrogations sur la capacité des organisations existantes à produire des résultats probants et à se saisir des nouveaux enjeux, et finalement par une remise en cause plus profonde par certains acteurs, par certains pays, de l'ordre multilatéral fondé, centré sur l'ONU, tel qu'il a été créé à la suite de la Seconde Guerre mondiale. Il s'agisse de tentatives de, de réinterprétation des règles, de remise en cause euh, de, des acteurs établis ou encore d'une attaque plus frontale euh, contre le, le principe même de coopération internationale au nom euh, de la défense de euh, la souveraineté et de l'unilatéralisme. Que... Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for organizing this session. I'd like to thank the organizers particularly for inviting me to speak to you today. I'm going to be speaking to you more particularly about the Alliance for Multilateralism, which was set up two years ago. It was set up in 2019 after it became apparent that the question of multilateralism was facing several crises. And I think there were three main challenges uh, that were being faced uh, worldwide. First of all, the fact that there was a shortage of means uh, to actually promote uh, multilateralism. Secondly, there was the question of the results and whether the results from existing institutions and organizations were sufficiently sound. And thirdly, there was a call into question of the multinational multilateral order as it existed in the UN system and as it had been established after World War II. So these questions, calls into questions, were for many different reasons, uh, either because uh, there were certain questionings of the uh, foundations of these uh, systems, but also because uh, there was a rejection of a form of international cooperation towards a sense of uh, unilateralism and sovereignty. C'est pour cette, euh, face à cette crise que les ministres français et allemands ont eu concomitamment, en même temps, la même intuition de rassembler euh, tous les partenaires de bonne volonté, croyant aux vertus de la coopération internationale et croyant également que le système multilatéral représente la meilleure garantie de la paix, de la sécurité et de la prospérité. La situation dans laquelle nous nous trouvions était celle euh, où de nombreux acteurs protestaient et semblent être extrêmement vocaux, euh, et où peu de personnes, peu de pays euh, défendaient le système. Donc c'est ainsi euh, que euh, donc la France et l'Allemagne, euh, ayant la conviction euh, que le soutien au multilatéralisme était majoritaire, ont proposé de créer l'Alliance pour le multilatéralisme. Cette alliance tourne autour de trois objectifs. Il s'agit peut... premièrement de défendre et de promouvoir l'ordre international fondé sur le droit et ses principes face aux remises en cause. Deuxièmement, 
Il s'agit d'aider les organisations internationales existantes à se reformer, à être plus efficaces et à mieux délivrer des résultats pour les citoyens, notamment en travaillant avec de, nombreux acteurs, de nouveaux acteurs, comme la société civile ou le secteur privé. Et troisièmement, lancer des initiatives fortes, innovantes, dans des secteurs qui sont nouveaux pour l'ONU, pour les organisations internationales existantes, qui sont parfois des angles morts de la scène multilatérale et où la gouvernance doit être renforcée. Um, it was uh, in face of this and because of these crises uh, that the ministers of, from France, of foreign affairs of France and Germany, decided simultaneously to set up the Alliance for Multilateralism. And in fact, uh, they had the same intuition, and that was that it was important to bring together people of uh, the same thinking and goodwill who believed in the virtues of international cooperation and also to show that the multilateral system did represent the best guarantee of peace, security, and prosperity. And uh, this was at a time when many of the uh, people who were speaking out against multilateralism were becoming more and more vocal. So as I said, the French and German ministers of foreign affairs got together and decided on the setting up of this alliance. It has three goals. First of all, it's to defend and promote a rule based international order and this is uh, particularly faced uh, with these uh, questions uh, that were being raised uh, around the world. Secondly, it was also to help existing international organizations uh, become more modern and update uh, the operating conditions so that they could deliver the results more satisfactorily. And thirdly, it was to launch uh, strong initiatives in new innovative areas um, so that some of the areas which were perhaps blind spots in uh, governance or areas that had not been sufficiently developed could be corrected. Donc, euh, s'agissant euh, maintenant de l'originalité de cette initiative euh, franco-allemande, euh, euh, j'aimerais euh, souligner un peu ses méthodes, son organisation. Tout d'abord, euh, l'Alliance pour le multilatéralisme n'est pas une organisation, ça n'est pas un club avec des membres euh, encartés. Il s'agit d'un cadre informel de discussion réunissant des ministres des Affaires étrangères. La participation aux différentes réunions est libre et le soutien aux initiatives que nous portons dans ce cadre est à géométrie variable. L'Alliance pour le multilatéralisme repose sur l'idée d'un multilatéralisme de la preuve. C'est la deuxième idée, c'est-à-dire que nous ne cherchons pas à faire du blabla des discussions sur différents sujets, nous cherchons à proposer des solutions, à montrer donc des projets qui ont réussi, des bonnes pratiques, des initiatives concrètes pour lesquelles nous souhaitons rallier de nouveaux soutiens et encourager donc d'autres pays à, à, à montrer eux également leurs bonnes pratiques. Donc il ne s'agit pas de soutenir l'ONU pour soutenir l'ONU, il s'agit de montrer comment nous travaillons concrètement avec des organisations internationales, avec des partenaires innovants de la société civile, des entreprises du secteur privé, avec des États, pour trouver des solutions aux problèmes concrets que nous rencontrons. Et finalement, j'aimerais aussi souligner que même si cette session est consacrée au rôle de l'Europe, l'Alliance pour le multilatéralisme n'est pas une initiative européenne. Ce n'est pas une initiative dans le cadre européen. Ça n'est pas porté par les institutions européennes. Et, et dès le début, nous nous sommes adressés à une très grande diversité géographique. Les, les coprésidents de la première réunion étaient le Ghana, le Mexique, le Chili, ainsi que Singapour, ce qui montre que l'attachement au multilatéralisme n'est pas uniquement européen, même si c'est dans l'ADN européen, s'il est mondial et partagé très largement par une grande majorité d'États. Um, so the, what makes the alliance a little different and original is the way in which it operates, its methods and its working practices. It's not an established organization. It's not a club with members or anything of that sort. It's far more informal. It's a bit like a network between ministers of foreign affairs and um, the participation 
in its meetings is uh, free and open. It also uh, fluctuates, the size uh, varies uh, depending on who is actually participating in these meetings. The second important idea is that we uh, like to um, base ourselves on evidence-based multilateralism, that is on proofs. It's not just a question of rhetoric and talking, uh, but we have to come up with real solutions and come up with best practices, concrete examples that can be of uh, help to other countries. And uh, this is uh, something that we feel strongly about. It's not merely uh, supporting the UN for the sake of it, but it's also to work with other institutions, with the private sector and others to promote the ideas that the UN stands for. And thirdly, even though um, there are many European countries involved, it is not a European or an exclusively European initiative. From the very beginning, it has been extremely diverse uh, and the co-chairs at the uh, initial meeting were Ghana, Mexico, Chile and Singapore and so even if uh, these questions are very much part of the DNA of Europe and European countries are represented, it has from the very beginning been a global initiative. C'est une euh, cette initiative donc en deux ans d'existence donc a, a est parvenu à s'imposer comme un club reconnu sur la scène internationale pour faire émerger des solutions euh, aux problèmes les plus urgents. Donc, nous avions euh, commencé euh, avec six initiatives euh, prenant de, de nombreux, dans de nombreux domaines d'action, qu'il s'agisse du numérique, euh, du désarmement, du droit humanitaire, euh, du changement climatique euh, et d'autres domaines, vraiment reflétant l'ensemble du spectre des nations d'activités de, de, euh, du système multilatéral. Depuis, donc, nous avons tenu dix réunions, donc en, 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 années, en, en deux années écoulées, euh, accueillant toujours une très forte participation et euh, au moins 80 euh, participants à chacune des plénières, euh, donc deux fois par an donc à New York et à Genève, et de nombreux participants également aux réunions techniques euh, intermédiaires. Alors, je vous donnerai donc euh, euh, un exemple d'une grande réussite de l'Alliance pour le multilatéralisme, qui est celui de sa mobilisation suite à la crise de la COVID-19. Um, so, as I said, we've been in existence for two years and uh, we have met re uh, repeatedly to try and find solutions to the most urgent issues that the world is facing. There are six areas, more or less, in which we've been working quite strongly. There's uh, the digital economy, disarmament, humanitarian law, and climate change. We've had approximately 10 meetings since the beginning with a large number of participants. There are usually approximately 80 participants at our plenaries that are held in New York and Geneva, but we also have technical meetings where uh, there is good attendance. And we've had some good results. Uh, one of the successes is what I would like to now talk to you about, and that is uh, the uh, action we took because of COVID-19. Effectivement, euh, suite donc, à, à, au début de l'épidémie, euh, le, le système multilatéral euh, fonctionnait mal, ne parvenait pas à se réunir sur une base régulière. Et l'Alliance pour le multilatéralisme a été un des cadres où, pour la première fois, les participants ont pu discuter pour préparer donc les pistes de réforme à venir de l'OMS. C'est ainsi que, dès le mois d'avril 2020, en amont de l'Assemblée mondiale de la santé, nous avons tenu une, une réunion qui a permis d'adopter une déclaration euh, réaffirmant notre plein soutien au rôle pivot euh, de l'OMS à une époque où ça n'était pas évident et qui a servi de base pour la résolution présentée par l'Union européenne euh, sur le soutien à l'OMS dans la COVID-19 adoptée à l'unanimité lors de l'Assemblée mondiale de la santé. La, la, après euh, cette réunion, euh, l'Alliance pour le multilatéralisme a également été le lieu où ont été présentées les pistes, d'abord franco-allemandes, de renforcement de l'architecture multilatérale de la santé en juin 2020. 
Donc, ces, ces pistes sont au, au, au nombre de, de cinq. Il s'agit d'abord de renforcer les systèmes nationaux de santé, de renforcer la mise en œuvre du RSI, ainsi que des, vérifications de, des capacités de vérification indépendantes de sa mise en œuvre. Il s'agit ensuite de réfléchir à l'introduction de niveaux d'alerte intermédiaires, puis finalement, de, 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 la, la quatrième, c'est la mise en place d'une approche d'une seule santé et finalement de financer durablement l'Organisation mondiale de la santé. So, um, immediately after the pandemic began, uh, it was at a time when multilateralism was not actually operating or functioning as best uh, as it could. And it is at this time that the Alliance uh, was a perfect framework, a perfect uh, venue for uh, discussions to be taken on the reforms that were required for the WHO. And that was where the first meeting was held. So it was in April 2020, uh, before the World Health Assembly, that we had a meeting where we decided and re uh, I reaffirmed the very central role that the WHO could play. And a e-resolution was, was presented, which uh, indicated support for the WHO, which was unanimously adopted. After this meeting, uh, where against France and Germany had made uh, several proposals, in June 2020, the um, multilateral health architecture reform was proposed, and that is made up of uh, several uh, chapters uh, which deal with different aspects, uh, such as the um, reinforcing the national health services, uh, the interim health alert system, the implementation of uh, the decisions that were taken by the WHO and also the way in which to get the RSA to work. Et, et, et finalement, donc, un, un autre très beau succès a été le lancement du panel d'experts de haut niveau, Une seule santé, qui fait travailler ensemble euh, l'Organisation mondiale de la santé, la FAO, l'OIE, qui est l'Organisation internationale de la santé animale, et le PNUE, le Programme des Nations Unies pour l'environnement. Et, et c'est la première fois donc, que nous parvenons à faire travailler ensemble donc, ces trois euh, organisations et le PNUE. Pour... Pardon. A another example of uh, success, of good results, has been the launching of a high-level um, meeting for One Health. This is the high-level um, level meeting concerning a program called One Health, which brings together the WHO, the FAO, the International Organization for Animal Health, and UNEP. And it's the first time that these three organizations have been working with UNEP. Il, il s'agit donc de faire le lien entre la santé humaine, animale et environnementale, donc dans le contexte d'érosion de la biodiversité, euh, car l'on voit bien que la grande majorité des maladies aujourd'hui sont d'origine zoonotique. Donc tous ces succès euh, et le, le, le succès dans, dans la durée des réunions de l'Alliance montrent que le système multilatéral et ses méthodes euh, ont aujourd'hui un soutien qui est très largement majoritaire, qui demandait juste à être exprimé. Donc, les, les événements ont confirmé que nous avons plus que jamais besoin d'une coopération et d'une solidarité internationale renforcée et que nous devons euh, renforcer la gestion multilatérale des biens publics mondiaux. Ainsi, comme l'a indiqué le ministre des Affaires étrangères, Jean-Yves Le Drian, devons mettre en place une véritable gouvernance du monde et de la planète. C'est l'objectif que se propose d'aider l'Alliance pour le multilatéralisme avec sa méthode en proposant des initiatives nouvelles, des petits pas très concrets, en aidant toutes les bonnes volontés à se manifester dans un contexte qui est consensuel et non antagonisant. Donc la prochaine réunion se tiendra dans le cadre du Forum de Paris sur la paix donc dans un mois, au mois de novembre, et devrait cette fois-ci porter davantage sur les aspects d'alimentation et d'agriculture. Je vous remercie. So, as I was saying, uh, this...
grouping together of the WHO, FAO, UNEP uh, and the Animal Health Organization was one way of linking questions concerning human, animal and environmental health, that is biodiversity, because it is quite clear that many of the new diseases that are emerging are of uh, or an animal origin. So these uh, successes was one way for us to once again find proof that multilateralism support does exist, but that it was important to bring that forward. And it was also a way of showing that in moments of crises, international solidarity is what people turn towards and look up to. And this is what we at the Alliance have been promoting. As the French Minister for Foreign Affairs, Mr. Le Drian, has said quite clearly, what we have to implement is a truly global government for the world and for our planet. And this is what we're doing with our Alliance. We're finding new methods, new concrete ways in which to deal with this, to find the consensus that exists. And consensus in the clearest way worldwide. Next month, we will be meeting at the Paris Peace Forum, and we will be uh, dealing at that forum, particularly with subjects concerning food and farming. Thank you for your attention. Merci, Jeremy. Très intéressant. Uh, thank you, Jeremy. Very, very interesting. And uh, lots of uh, clear opportunity emerging for the building of this new structure of global governance that I think we all agree is needed. I would like now to turn the floor over to the former prime minister of Burkina Faso, Tertius Zongo, Monsieur Zongo Abu. Merci beaucoup, et merci pour la parole. Alors, euh, je crois qu'on a déjà eu un certain nombre de messages au cours des précédentes sessions qui ont été résumées par euh, Dr Sébastien et tout de suite euh, à notre session il y a des messages qui qui sont ressortis sur le thème global euh, euh, qui nous est soumis. Alors je me propose peut-être de faire quelques commentaires. Le premier commentaire c'est peut-être faire un constat et puis et le deuxième commentaire c'est quoi la situation actuelle de notre gouvernance au niveau global et puis de l'objectif où est-ce qu'on peut aller. Voilà un peu une petite structuration que je souhaite, si le temps le permet, d'aborder. Much. Thank you very much for inviting me and giving me the floor. I, I think there have been several messages that, that have come across during our previous sessions, and I think they've been very well summed up by Dr. Sebastian. So I think I would like to limit myself to a few commentaries. I'd like to first of all start off by probably taking stock of where we are and uh, how things stand. Secondly, I'd like to talk about uh, global governance and what we understand by that. And thirdly, I'd like to talk about the long-term challenges and exactly where we're going. So that is, if you like, uh, the structure of my present. Alors, le, con le constat. Le constat aujourd'hui, lorsque on le regarde, moi, je le résume en deux grands points. Le premier point, c'est que le multilatéralisme, qui est un instrument eh, de paix par excellence, lorsqu'on regarde, il est aujourd'hui affaibli. Il est quelquefois contesté. Et puis, il est quelquefois négligé. Ça, c'est vraiment le constat qu'on fait du multilatéralisme. Et le deuxième élément, c'est que derrière ce multilatéralisme affaibli, contesté, on se rend compte que le monde semble aujourd'hui être orphelin d'une vision collective. Quelle est la vision du monde sur laquelle tout le monde se met d'accord, que ce soit politiquement, à tous les niveaux, et essayer d'arriver à un résultat qui soit à la satisfaction de la majorité. So, and I'd like to start off with a, a statement of facts of the way I see them. And I think we'd start off by saying, firstly, that multilateralism, which is par excellence, the instrument of peace and promoting of peace, is today weakened, contested, and somewhat neglected. 
And I think um, that's the first point. And secondly, behind this issue of a weakened, contested and neglected form of multilateralism is the other fact that we have to accept. And that is the world today seems to be somewhat bereft of a collective vision. And this idea of what is our collective vision, where exactly how can we express it and how is something that I think we should... Alors, donc, euh, lorsqu'on regarde la situation aujourd'hui, euh, une chose est évidente, c'est que aux classifications traditionnelles qui ont été héritées du passé, où nous avions en face de nous des guerres civiles et des conflits qui sont nés euh, du fait des puissances étrangères, notre monde global aujourd'hui est traversé par ce que moi j'appelle de nombreuses ruptures. Et dans ces ruptures, on a des ruptures politiques, on a des ruptures économiques, on a des ruptures climatiques, on a des ruptures démographiques, on a la violence, on a des ruptures technologiques et je peux en citer d'autres. C'est que ces nouveaux défis, ce que j'appelais les ruptures, ces nouveaux défis, fermente, je dois appeler avec beaucoup de prudence, un désordre. Et le désordre qui est, qui, est, qui, est, qui, est, qui, est, qui est fermenté par ces nouveaux défis ont pour nom la criminalité organisée, le terrorisme, la corruption, les trafics de tout genre, les déséquilibres climatiques. Et le point important à ce niveau, c'est que dans ce nouveau désordre mondial, les frontières traditionnelles, frontières entre les affaires internes et les affaires externes, frontières entre les affaires civiles et les affaires militaires, frontières entre les affaires publiques et les affaires privées, s'effacent. Quelquefois, on ne voit plus de frontières. Et parce que ces différentes frontières s'effacent, on sent l'impuissance quelquefois du politique à apporter une solution efficace. So when you look at the way things stand in our world, you can see that the traditional classification of what we understood by uh, the way things uh, operated with civil wars or conflicts that were caused by the presence of foreign powers uh, no longer actually exist quite as so simply. And in fact, I think our world is made up of a whole series of um, fractures. And these fractures could be political or economic or, or uh, climate oriented or demographic or violence uh, generated or technical in nature. And all these different flag fractures lead to new challenges in our societies because they lead to a form of fermentation, which leads to, and I'm being cautious in the way I use this term, uh, leads to a form of disorder. And that disorder in turn generates uh, things such as organized crime, terrorism, corruption, trafficking of all sorts and uh, climate and other imbalances. So it's a new world disorder, so to speak. And in this new world disorder, the traditional borders that existed between what was internal or you know, domestic and foreign or what was civilian and military or what was public and private seem to have uh, disappeared in some cases. And it is because of this that many politicians, in fact, find it extremely difficult or practically incapable, are incapable capable of finding a solution. Alors, euh, sur ce point, je reviens un peu sur le terrain euh, sahélien, euh, parler un peu de la menace sécuritaire qu'il y a au niveau du Sahel, qui fait partie un peu des éléments de notre discussion. Euh, Aujourd'hui, lorsque vous regardez un peu tous ces phénomènes, qui dépassent les frontières. Vous prenez une frontière entre le Burkina et le Mali, et vous avez une entrée, une sortie des terroristes un peu comme ils veulent. Même quand vous voulez parler un peu de, 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 de comment on appelle ça, de l'extrémisme. L'extrémisme 
tu es, 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 es véhiculé dans un pays, les gens se déplacent, ils le véhiculent dans un autre pays, et très rapidement, si vous ne faites pas attention, on arrive au niveau des États à s'accuser d'ingérence. C'est pourquoi le premier point de conclusion que je tire, et notre modérateur a insisté là-dessus, professeur Dan, c'est que si nous voulons retourner à de la stabilité, retourner à, à un bien-être partagé, je parle de la région du Sahel, il nous faut changer de, de méthode de coopération. Et changer ce méthode de coopération, le temps est court, je vais aborder deux petits points. Le petit point, le premier point, c'est ce que j'ai appelé renforcer le travail d'analyse. Tant qu'on ne renforce pas le travail d'analyse sur le terrain, on arrivera à des conclusions, on mettra en œuvre des actions, mais on n'aura jamais réglé les vrais problèmes. Et pour le faire, il faut que nous impliquons plusieurs acteurs du terrain des gens qui sont déjà sur le terrain, les mettre autour d'une table, discuter des problèmes de la région, voir comment on arrive à mieux connaître la sociologie des populations, voir comment on arrive à mieux connaître l'économie politique de la région, voir comment on arrive à mieux connaître les besoins des populations et bâtir des politiques de développement. Mais une fois qu'on met toutes ces personnes ensemble et qu'elles sont d'accord que c'est l'orientation qui doit être prise, il faut que le travail commence sur plusieurs fronts. Et ça, je crois que eh, la République française a produit un, beaucoup de documents à travers euh, l'Alliance la, pour le Sahel ou l'AFD qui montrent qu'une fois qu'on on est d'accord, il faut aborder les plans économiques les plans politiques, les plans sécuritaires et avancer ensemble. Donc, c'est très clair qu'aujourd'hui, il y a une autre façon de faire, plus d'expertise locale dans l'analyse des problèmes amène une meilleure solution sur le terrain, ce qui n'a pas toujours été le cas. Le deuxième point, pour que vous les résumez ensemble, Yes, you, yeah, 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 yeah. yes, you can Merci. go, no problem. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, so on this particular point, I'd just like to talk about the threats that we can, that people are facing in the Sahel area, which is, I think, uh, of relevance here. Because when you actually look at the phenomenon in that part of the world, you realize uh, that the borders between countries such as Burkina and Mali can be very uh, impermeable, uh, very permeable. And in fact, terrorists or extremists uh, can cross them uh, with impunity. The question about extremism or uh, fundamentalism is also something which can be carried very easily from one country to another through these porous borders. And it results in uh, very frequently uh, countries ending up accusing each other of uh, interfering in internal matters. So as uh, Professor Etsy said earlier on, if we want to get back to a, a certain stability, if we want to get back to a sense of a shared sense of well-being in the Sahel, for example, we have to change the methods of cooperation that we use. And for that, I would like to suggest uh, that there are a couple of things that we could do. The first one being that we should actually work much more closely on the analytical side of things in the field so that we can find ways of solving problems. There are many different stakeholders uh, to consult and to talk, but they've got to be people who are actually in the field. Get them around the table, talk to them about different aspects such as the sociology of the population, the political economy uh, that exists, uh, and the real requirements of the local people. And once that has been determined, one can work on a policy of development. Once they agree, then it is possible to work on several fronts simultaneously. And the French government has uh, published many documents, either through the Alliance for the Sahel or through the AFD, uh, the, which is the Development Agency on economic, political and security issues. But it's important now to work together jointly um, so that the local uh, aspects are better expressed. And this is something which has not always been taken into consideration. Monsieur le Premier Ministre, je dois garder un peu de temps pour notre collègue de la Chine. Allez, Alors, je, 
Je, Alors, je dis juste. Je, je, je demande euh, un dernier euh, moment de, quand même. Juste, juste un mot et puis je m'arrête là. Alors, le, le dernier point, c'est le, le deuxième point. Le deuxième point. Je ne vais pas aborder mon deuxième point, les défis du futur. Le, le deuxième point sur ce qui concerne le Sahel, c'est aborder les problèmes de fond des crises. Et on n'a pas toujours abordé de fond les problèmes de crise. Et cela s'explique. Un, les partenaires au développement qui soutiennent les pays, et c'est normal, vous diront qu'ils ne s'interfèrent pas dans des sujets politiques. Ce n'est pas leur mandat, ce qui est juste. Mais est-ce que parce qu'on ne veut pas s'interférer dans des questions politiques, est-ce qu'il est interdit d'être informé sur des questions politiques? Parce que lorsqu'on regarde les, les vrais problèmes qui en, engendrent les crises, sont généralement les mêmes, c'est la gouvernance. Les questions de gouvernance, quand vous les creusez, c'est des questions politiques, c'est des questions de justice, c'est des questions d'équité, c'est un certain nombre de questions. Il faut accepter les regarder. C'est des questions d'absence de capacité de l'État. L'État lui-même, qu'est-ce qu'il est, qu'est-ce qu'il qu qu faut faire pour le refonder Quelquefois, on va penser que c'est des questions politiques de souveraineté, mais non, tant que vous n'avez pas un État capable à, à terme, il ne peut pas assurer, je dirais, la protection des populations. C'est des questions d'inégalité sociale, ce sont des questions de chômage, c'est des questions de corruption que nous, en, nous avons abordées. Donc, monsieur le modérateur, je voudrais, pour m'arrêter là et donner le temps au prochain, dire nous devons faire très attention parce que tous les points que je viens de souligner se nourrissent mutuellement. Le chômage nourrit la corruption. Le chômage nourrit les inégalités et chacun nourrit l'autre. Ce qui fait que nous avons besoin d'inventer aussi des nouvelles formes de dialogue et de coopération. Um... The second point that I wanted to make, and this is also on the Sahel, is that we've really got to analyze in depth the reasons for a crisis. And very frequently when uh, development agencies work uh, in countries, they decide quite rightly that they're not going to interfere in the political aspects of things or political questions. But that does not mean that they should not acknowledge the political side of things or the political reality behind. Because questions of governance, after all, are real issues concerning politics, uh, equity, the lack of capacity. And I think ultimately this is what it's all about, a lack of real uh, capacity building by governments or states is something which leads to a lack of governance. And if no state has that form of capacity, then it cannot protect its population and it leads to uh, unemployment, corruption, and so on and so forth. And all these different issues actually nourish each other and feed off each other. So if there's a lot of unemployment, it leads to corruption and uh, it can lead therefore to new forms uh, of uh, instability. Inst Merci, uh, Monsieur Zongo. We will turn now to our third panelist, uh, Professor Ji Zhu. Uh, he is CEO and President of the Energy Foundation China. Professor Zhu. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, thank you very much. I'm very happy to, to be here to share our view on the global governance and um, especially in the view to enhance uh, the cooperation between China and the European uh, uh, Union. Uh, in fact, I when I look at the question about the uh, entry point or leverage point, uh, uh, how to move forward in the context of the current uh, geopolitical ecosystem, uh, especially facing uh, when uh, the um, the global ch uh, challenges, including climate change, uh, uh, COVID pandemics, uh, and also the um, uh, the recovery from uh, uh, the, the the poor economic performance. Uh, I, I think we we have a lot of things to do, but uh, before I move to the uh, the detailed uh, um, uh, the proposal, uh, I would like to say we should start from building up 
the common ground, the uh, I, I mean the the political basis uh, for our uh, uh, cooperation. That that means that we need to build up a healthy uh, uh, geopolitical uh, environment uh, to ensure we have the necessary bottom line level of political trust. Uh, this is extremely important. But so, certainly, I'm so happy to see after um, a sort of um, uh, a tension of uh, political uh, relation uh, set between China and uh, Europe. Uh, I don't mean uh, this tension had uh, disappeared, but I just mean right that That's very extreme uh, uh, tension. Uh, I saw some positive uh, momentum, especially uh, just several days ago, uh, China and Europe uh, just signed, uh, I mean, launched the joint announcement uh, for climate change, and including uh, some negative, uh, sorry, some positive messages there. I mean, uh, in uh, uh, referring to uh, not only the normal uh, existing, uh, also covering uh, some additional um, uh, items. So, um, for example, um, um, uh, coal related issue and the non CO2 machine, et cetera, et cetera. I, I think that, that showed very uh positive signal already and what let's learn uh from these uh, uh exercise in the past months i i think uh the good thing for the two sides and they recognize although they have some political disagreement or political di uh, uh, dispute for example on xinjiang issues on hong kong yeah, and uh, I also on some, some very uh, long uh, debate on human rights, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But uh, the two sides now they are learning to manage all the um, uh, uh, the disputes, uh, especially in terms of uh, geopolitical relation, and then they are learning to find a way. Well. They have some disputes there, uh, there, but they continue to try to uh, to make efforts uh, for cooperation, especially for uh, climate issue. But I would say there should be some uh, balance between two set of uh, relation. I mean, one political or geopolitical relation, and on the other hand, it's some cooperation or. Re uh, uh, cooperative relation on very specific issues, such as the climate issue. And I, I see if we can learn to manage the balance between the two types of um, uh, relation, uh, we can. Although sometimes uh, uh, the balance might be very vulnerable, very, uh, uh, very uh, sensitive. But uh, anyway, this is the way we can work in reality. And then, uh, but certainly, I, I think the most most important uh, basis or common ground is uh, the the view on, uh, I mean, how to to run the global governance. So that's a, a multilateral, uh, a multilateral, uh, 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 multilateral uh, rhythm. Uh, I, I think this is the common ground. So let's go to United Nations. Let's go to G20. Let's go to WTO, I mean, for all the rule-based mechanism, and then we can uh, have the, the common starting point. And uh, based on that kind of uh, political uh, uh, consensus, we can consider some uh, more specific area for cooperation, especially between China and Europe. Uh, for example, uh, so we can continue to work for policy dialogue uh, and the coordination, especially uh, in the view to uh, meet the challenge 
of climate change uh, pandemic, uh, I mean, COVID-19 pandemics, uh, as well as the green recovery. Uh, I think we have a lot to exchange, to coordinate uh, for better uh, understanding. This is one. The second one is a very common but very fundamental area. I mean, green trade, green uh, uh, investment, uh, based on uh, recognized uh, and uh, um, uh, agreed standards and uh, tech. So certainly we can communicate and even negotiate. Uh, I mean, the standards, the uh, taxonomy, uh and uh, with the expectation i mean to reach some agreement on that and then we can jointly to shape our trade our investment and e uh, and also technology uh, r d together i mean to make them low carbon and uh, no need to say green finance is another area uh to work together based on uh, multilateral forum like G20 and the based on um, IMF and uh, uh, World Bank and other multilateral development bank, uh, including AIIB. Uh, so uh, this is another um, uh, arena we can work together. We have a huge potential to uh, work together. Um, uh, the next one is tech so uh, I saw um, very natural uh, advantages, comparative advantage from the two sides. Uh, with my understanding, the uh, advantage for R&D capacity, uh, very good scientists there, engineer there, uh, for many, uh, I mean, very, very uh, uh, nice universities and the company and research center, there they 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 are very very uh, uh, advanced but um, if they only develop the technology in their laboratory in their campus uh, i do not believe the sustainable way for them i mean to accelerate the the, the technology to address uh, climate change and uh, on the other hand i also see the comparative advantage for, from Chinese side. That, that's number one, the size of the market. And these create the opportunity for European uh, science, technology, and the company to go to China to make full use of the, the, uh, the nature of Chinese market, especially its size, and to uh, make uh, market uh, iteration of technology happen there. In that way, we can uh, expect to accelerate the, the learning curve decline. Uh, that, that means to make the cost uh, uh, lower and lower in a very fast pace. Uh, this had been happened uh, in many sectors, many types of technology. I, I think we should complement each other, um, but certainly again, based on rule uh, that that also include IP protection rule. Um, and, the, and another field is education and uh, uh, personnel ex exchange. So we have a long tradition for European universities and the Chinese university to exchange their students, their scholars, and then they share uh, the common knowledge basis. This is extremely important. I mean, for young generation, especially, to to build up their knowledge basis, common knowledge basis, and then this will ensure them. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, enable them uh, to understand each other better, and to easier make them easier to reach consensus based on the same or the similar uh, knowledge basis, and also the similar value judgment basis. So education and uh, uh, per uh, uh, personnel exchange uh, should be very, very important. Uh, 
I want to emphasize the importance uh, for the two sides, I mean, European side and the Chinese side, to work together in the third party, especially in developing country for the mitigation and adaptation of the climate change in Africa, in South Asia, or Southeastern Asia, and the Latin America. Uh, because in that, we can also combine or integrate different comparative um, advantages there to, I mean, from European side, as I said, or maybe uh, you have the advantage in capital, in uh, management, in technology, and well, China uh, uh, had very similar experience and less learned, I mean, especially matching to developing country environment. Uh, and uh, I, I, I think in some specific, uh, such specific field like uh, as uh, solar or wind power uh, or uh, energy efficiency technology like uh, efficient cooling, heating, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I, I think those are very, very uh, meaningful uh, to make developing countries develop their economy well in a, a very low carbon manner. Uh, I, I think this, uh, I just regard that as a matter of, um, how to say, uh, uh, innovation of development path. So certainly you can repeat the historic path in industrialized countries in the history, uh, but I, I believe developing country, they have the opportunity I mean, to grow their economy, but with lower car, uh, carbon technology than the, uh, based on uh, the, the, uh, the institutional arrangement and the policy arrangement in this century. Uh, and also uh, when the support from international uh, community, especially from Europe, from North America, and also from China, but maybe in different way, different manner, but uh, no problem. Let's just do it jointly. And in that way, we can expect, uh, I mean, globally, uh, we can reach uh, 1.5 degree target jointly uh, and uh, make the transaction cost as low as possible. But again, uh, let's uh, make a, the enabling environment for, uh, I mean, for the bottom line uh, trust level. Uh, uh, in that way, I, 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 I'm uh, a little bit more optimistic uh, climate change, global climate change. I, I stop here, thank you. Professor Zhu, thank you so very much. Uh, enormously interesting perspective. And uh, I, I, I sh I'm pleased about the optimism you're reflecting in terms of, uh, of what the opportunities look like. Um, we are out of time. I am not gonna try to summarize what Hi, was- Hi, Chair, very... I finished my, uh, my remarks. Thank you. Could you please uh, continue? For, I mean, to turn the floor to the next speaker. Thank you very much, Professor Zhu. We are grateful for your intervention. And uh, I am now gonna need to close out this conversation. Uh, Hello, this can you hear panel. me? Uh, we are, I'm not gonna try to summarize given the short time, simply to say what a wonderful wide ranging conversation it was, highlighting from my point of view, the scope and depth of the challenge of managing our global interdependence. And uh, it is going to be a big task for those who are working to reimagine our structure of global governance. But I come away with the sense uh, more strongly than I came in with that we were really going to need to have innovation in our modes and methods of cooperation. So let me uh, take this moment to thank uh, all of our panelists. Uh, and I will uh, at this point declare our panel at an end and uh, indicate that we've got a 10 minute break uh, and then the program begins again. So thank you all very much for listening in and a special thanks to our panelists. We are online. Okay, so good afternoon.
to everyone. This is the last session of this very important meeting. My name is Julia Martin Lefebvre. In this particular case, I'll introduce myself as chairing the Strategic Advisory Board of IDRI. I have other hats, but that's one of my favorite ones. And I just want to say, I want to congratulate IDRI for what I've seen so far of this meeting. So this is the next to the last session, and it is about how the how European think, think tanks can view the main messages from the conference. What are your visions, strategic options, and the role of Europe? So first of all, let me introduce a very distinguished panel. So if you just sort of raise your hand when I say, say uh, your name so that people can see you. So Osa Persson, Persson, I think you say, is research director and deputy director of the Stockholm Environment Institute. Uh, hello, Osa, thank you for being there. Céline Charveria is executive director, Institute for European Environmental Policies. Céline, you're there. Natalie Tocci is Director Instituto Affari Internazionali. There she is. And do I have Katari, Anna Katarina yet? Uh, we're hoping to have Anna Katarina. Are you there? No, I Not yet. Know. Okay. All right. And then I've got, of course, Sebastian Treyer, who is the Executive Director of IDRI. Great, okay. So uh, uh, before we start, I just want to say a word about the two alliances of European think tanks. Think Sustainable Europe, which was established in 2019, and the European Think Tank Group on Development, established in 2010. So these are alliances. I've worked all my life in alliances, so obviously I'm a little bit biased, but I think they're extremely important, both internally as well as outside of Europe. They're both grounded in the idea that because of a fragmented political space in Europe, and we saw that at this meeting already, and because of the importance of decisions made in national capitals or by the European Council, there is indeed a need to have a think tank seeking coordinated impact both in Brussels and in the main capitals of European member states. So each of our panelists is involved in one or both of these alliances, that's why I mentioned them. So let's begin. I have asked three of our panelists to tell us in four minutes, I'm gonna be a little bit tough on that, four minutes each of you about the main messages as they seem uh, to them of this conference on the next generation of multilateralism. And, and let us know, for example, if you've seen any recommendations that could be useful for the think tanks, for the EU, and basically for our work. So I'm going to start with, I was going to start with Anna Katarina, but she's not there. So I'm going to start with OSA from SCI, Stockholm Environment Institute. Over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Julia. And again, a very warm thank you to Idri for uh, convening such a rich discussion on, on the need to renew multilateralism. Uh, it's so timely for many reasons. Um, I wanted to pick up on uh, three uh, messages or, or discussion points that have really come through uh, in these past three days. Uh, I hope to have time for three, let's see. Uh, constructive accountability, re-energizing uh, thinking on technology cooperation as a way to symmetrize power. Finally, uh, convening discussions on global risk. So starting with the first one, we heard many speakers talk about the lack of trust, that promises of solidarity um, sound empty somehow when coming from the global north and including the EU. Uh, there's a lack of credibility. Uh, this is quite understandable given the, the history of multilateralism and uh, in particular environmental cooperation that we have focused more on at SEI. So I think we need to uh, move from this promise-making, pledge-making culture to a more results delivery culture. Uh, especially before the COPs, we see a plethora of commitments, uh, pledges, promises, targets, which is of course positive in a way, but I think it also uh, is, is a bit unhealthy and maybe we now need to step into a next phase. And here I think the EU could lead by example in a new era of constructive accountability. So this 
by this, I mean accountability, not just in finger pointing, calling out, but also constructive in the sense of actually rewarding good results. Uh, accountability is an issue across many domains of uh, multilateral cooperation. So just focusing in on climate, uh, the EU could call for a climate accountability summit. We have had summits on climate action, getting everyone on the train. We have had summits on climate ambition, increasing ambition levels. Let's uh, perhaps now the time is, is uh, ripe to have an accountability summit. Uh, I think this is also important now as we uh, close the chapter on, on um, uh, the NDCs with this COP and start looking at the global stock take coming up in 2023. How can the EU set a high standard there? Not just uh, in terms of the, its reporting to the UNFCCC, but also supporting a, a rich discussion, shadow global stock takes, uh, accountability to the people in this exercise. And I also think there's a lot to do for think tanks uh, when considering the global stock take and promoting climate accountability, uh, both in terms of doing even more policy evaluation, really responding to the question, what works, but also tapping more effectively into the data revolution. There, is, uh, there are many ways now beyond national statistics offices to, to generate the data we need. Uh, the second point I had related to the calls for symmetry of power that we have heard in, in sessions um, in this conference, uh, which seem to often relate to representation, which is, of course, uh, very important and, and a, uh, an urgent need. But I think maybe a missing dimension or something we need to focus on also to build a better, more symmetric power structure for the future is uh, technology and innovation capacity to really build domestic capacity uh, in the Global South to really take part in this uh, green race to the top. Uh, because I do think we're here conflicting discourses here from the EU, it's, it's the green race, but also who participates in that race? How can we empower uh, countries with, with lower innovation capacity? So I think there is uh, a moment now and space for re-energizing, revitalizing discussions on technology transfer and technology co-development. Co Finally, uh, global risk. There are ideas now that, that we, uh, through multilateral cooperation, through the UN, we need to discuss global risks in new ways. Uh, we can observe that both the EU and the UN now with uh, our common agenda proposal are building up capacities for strategic foresight. Um, but I think here is, it's really important to not just make these nice desk products, nice reports, identifying global risks, but really translating them into co concrete proposals for reform. Uh, one example here is uh, understanding better transboundary climate risk. And I'm pleased that SEI and IDRI are collaborating on an, an initiative on adaptation without borders, understanding how climate risk cascades through the global system. Uh, so here's an opportunity for the EU to support um, uh, sort of concrete uh, initiatives in this space to better understand the risk, but also look at governance reforms. So those were my three um, points. And I wanted also to turn, I mean, speaking now from a Northern European perspective, uh, from Sweden, I think for the Swedish government, there is an opportunity to really um, uh, contribute now to this debate on renewed multilateralism with the Stockholm Plus 50 meeting coming up in June next year. We have already discussed in this conference um, the fact that we are now 50 years um, into international environmental cooperation. It's time to reflect and renew. And one of the themes for the Stockholm Plus 50 meeting will indeed be accelerated implementation. So I think this conference really uh, has produced uh, a lot of inputs to that discussion. Uh, how can we renew multilateralism? How can we improve intergenerational equity through innovative institutional uh, mechanisms and also potentially promote uh, more technology co-development? So with that, I wanted to again thank uh, all our friends at IDRI for this wonderful conference. Thank you. Over to you, Julia. Thank you very much. That was very important. Let's go on to Sebastian. You also have four minutes. 
Thank you very much, uh, Julia, and thank you, Arsene, for, for, for this uh, account. I share uh, a lot of what Arsene has been saying, for, of course, but I was struck particularly by the, 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 the fact that utopia was crashing with realpolitik during the whole conference. Mm -hmm. First, um, I, we heard a lot that, uh, about what does not work and the legacy of history, particularly the asymmetries in the structure of power, also the asymmetry in the structure of the economic system, tracing back to the colonial era and to the extractive model of growth. That was very present in the whole conference. Mm -hmm. I heard also a lot of anger, uh, and I really mm -hmm. want to mention that anger is mounting in the global south uh, and it's in, in its civil society. Uh, and really, that this is really linked to the issue that we have a deficit of trust and confidence, a deficit of credibility and a fatigue of promises of solidarity that do not mm -hmm. translate. This might be more structural than, than just the vaccine problem that we have currently. And, I mm -hmm. think and other northern countries and even China needs to listen, need to, listen to that. Uh, and nevertheless, despite of these structural uh, problems of asymmetries of power, uh, uh, there was a very firm reaffirmation of an ideal vision of what is needed. Uh, that it already, this vision already exists. It's not new. It's about Asia 2030. It's about solidarity. It's about inclusiveness, human rights, democracy. And this might seem completely utopian, uh, but it was really very importantly state, stated from the beginning the need to resymmetrize power. So we need to, to find ways to resymmetrize power in institutions and in the economic system. So this is striking, and I was asking myself, how realistic is it politically to make those changes despite the current uh, uh, rivalry between uh, the larger ge ge geopolitical powers? And it was very interesting to understand that there are clear avenues for changes in the global economic system with an economic rationale behind it. Uh, some incremental changes that matter, for instance, on the coordination of taxation, some more breakthrough, some breakthrough that still need to be made. And on trade, uh, uh, particularly, I think we need to see how that can be made. Uh, and I think uh, beyond these clear avenues that were traced, particularly on the economic system, it was also interesting to hear that for many of the civil society in Europe and outside Europe, there, there is political leverage uh, and political leverage will come from changes in the economic structure itself, Africa is going to become a, an economic player. Everybody knows that. So that will give power to Africa anyway. Uh, that the political leverage will come from the capacity to negotiate and protest. We heard a lot people from the civil society in the South saying, we are going to protest and we're going to, you're going to have to hear us, not just set us aside. We also heard that organized civil society will matter at regional, national and global scale. And that is going to have political leverage. And lastly, narratives, ideas, and science also matter if we want to have political leverage. So my last point is to say, what's in it for Europe? What can Europe do? And it was extremely complicated to be a European in this conference, I would say, particularly French, probably, <laughs> uh, because of the legacy uh, that, that was put at the center of, 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 all, it, of all of it. Uh, the EU was at the heart of both critiques and expectations. And I think that's interesting to, to, to listen to. Uh, the EU can make the unit, is in the capacity to make some of the unilater unilateral moves that are necessary to resymmetrize power, uh, given the size of its market, given its soft power. These changes to redistribute power can actually make sense for the European Union in its own interest, but we, need, we would need to discuss that, and I don't have the time to exemplify. But Europe would really need to rebuild much more confidence with their partners, particularly in Africa but also in Latin America and in other parts of Asia. Uh, and my last thing is to say, we need to think of that. If, if Europe is OK to, to give up power for others, what's in it for her? What's in it for Europe? And what's, is that really a strategy that is flying, that is sustainable when we, we are noticing that what counts is actually the, the economic rivalry between the US and China. So is that a reasonable strategic move that Europe can do? I think these are things that we need to continue discussing ahead of the French presidency of, of the European Union uh, next year. Uh, and be, be, because this is something on which we Europeans need to, need to continue discussions in our, discussing in our capitals and in Brussels. Over to you, Julia. Very much. Uh, Sebastian, I think at some point, uh, maybe you have it and I haven't seen it, you need to put together the list of participants so that we understand where the anger comes from. Hopefully it comes from everybody, really, and the, and the lack of trust and not just 
certain age group or certain geography. But I think it really is time to think about, to talk less about big statements and promises and then documents that are just sitting on bookshelves and, and move to action. So we'll have quite, all of us will have quite a lot to do. This is, this, this and, and now I feel very sad that we have such little time, but we'll have to continue this discussion. Okay, let me now uh, continue and give the floor um, now to two other think tank directors to rea react and discuss the political space for these recommendations. Is there an appetite? So in the current discussion between member states and the, and the conversation between the EU and other regions, again, based on what you have heard at this very important conference. So let's start with Celine. And again, I think I only have four minutes, but perhaps we'll have a little time at the end to come back. So Celine, over to you. Nice to be here with, with all of you. I mean, what really strikes me uh, listening to uh, the outcomes of the conference in this massive inherent tension. I mean, if you are in Brussels, the mood here is we are in a race against time. Uh, we are deeply, uh, we are looking at deep transformation uh, with very, very difficult political conversations ahead uh, between the member states about what, what is equity between European countries, but also within uh, European countries. Some governments really feel that in, if they implement the Green Deal fully, they might lose the elections. So it's getting to a, a, a level of uh, nervousness in terms of, can we indeed implement the Green Deal? Can we get uh, to, to net zero? How will we implement the new uh, climate package, which is called the uh, Fit for 55? And I think within that, there's actually very little space to necessarily or time or energy to consider the implications for the rest of the world. And also very often I feel a frustration about what is perceived in Brussels as the lack of progress or the lack of credible commitments by other players. If you look at the mood ahead of COP26, it's very clear that Europe feels pretty much on its own and that the others in terms that have comparable level of emissions uh, are, are, not, are not making comparable levels of, of commitment. And so with this frustration, also a temptation to become much more unilateral and much less collaborative, because the lesson that you could take from the last 10 years from a European point of view is like, we've tried to play with the others, but they're not playing, so we'll play on our own. And, and I think, therefore, you know, it's really important to bring back the messages from, from this conference to say, Maybe part of that is true, but the perception that other players have of you is completely different and there's a need to rebuild trust. And I would suggest that it's about narrative. And for me, we need to have a much more credible uh, narrative coming from Europe as part of Green Deal diplomacy, which is about just resilience and conversion and starting to look at the responsibility of Europe in terms of consumption emissions. Really put our ducks in a row in terms of supporting a green and fair poorest countries. I don't think that we have done what we need to do. Having, you know, resisting the temptation, for instance, on due diligence to not collaborate uh, in terms of addressing the most harmful commodity sectors and, and value chains on the carbon border adjustment mechanism. Europe needs to really convene a conversation about disciplines on those sorts of instruments, but also recycle revenues to help the world's poorest countries. And last but not least, we're talking a lot about strategic autonomy in Europe. This cannot be an agenda to capture resources at the expense of other countries. So again, we need to look at strategic autonomy, not just for Europe, but for everyone, so that everyone can implement the SDGs and make the transition, the green transition, a success. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think I'm starting to feel troubled too about being a European, but we're not going to give up. Thank you. So let's go now to Natalie, please. Well, thank you so much. And just let me start by saying happy birthday to Idri and, and really congratulations to Sebastian, to all the team for this 
Well, firstly, for this wonderful anniversary and for this uh, really incredible program that you set up over the last three days. I mean, I think as a partner uh, of uh, IDRI in the context of the European Think Tanks group, it's, uh, it's a real pleasure to be with you uh, today. So very, very briefly, uh, sort of in reaction to some of the points that, that really, I think, emerged uh, in this debate. I mean, firstly, you know, sort of, you know, we start from a kind of no brainer premise and the no brainer premise is that there is a broadly speaking shared a sort of sense that uh, in order to attain the global public goods that we're all after, international cooperation and, and sort of revamped multilateralism is the starting point. The problem, of course, is that once we sca start scratching that surface, uh, a number of cleavages really come to the fore. Uh, and, and I think the first one, which is actually the one that Celine was now referring to, is an internal European cleavage. Uh, I think, you know, as we're starting to grapple with what the Green Deal means in terms of uh, implementation and the distribution that affects that this uh, uh, can have, the political sustainability of that implementation, in a sense, you know, sort of beyond the, this is a good thing to do once you, you start doing it, um, some of the, the challenges really come to the which kind of lead to uh, an instinct either not to do it at all or to do it in a highly protectionist manner, which I think is really the point that Celine was highlighting. The second cleavage is really the one that emerged over the course of this conference, uh, which is really the sort of global north uh, and south uh, cleavage. It's an old cleavage, but in a sense, it's a cleavage which has acquired uh, really, I mean, new, new relevance in the context, particularly uh, of, uh, of the green transition. And the third, which is really kind of closer to my neck of the woods sitting here uh, in Cambridge, uh, Massachusetts, as, as I am, um, is really the cleavage uh, as that is emerging within the international system, a sort of new bipolarity between the United States and China, and how that is impacting on the feasibility, the political and strategic feasibility of, of the transition. And simply to sort of highlight as two final uh, reflections, how these three sets of cleavages, I think, are impacting uh, both on the what is it that we're trying to... How do we go beyond, just give some ideas. I, we had one idea already, uh, but how do we go beyond this lack of credibility that we, that decision makers are viewed as simply making campaign promises and not delivering. What, what should happen just practically about that? That's not only at this meeting, I think everybody feels it. The Climate Accountability Summit, summit was a suggestion made uh, by OSA, but if it just doesn't do anything but give more promises. So that's one question I have for you. And then what do we do, I can't ask all the questions, but what do we do about the internal European cleavage? As, as Natalie said very well in her beginning, does anybody have any ideas for that? And maybe the third question is, you're all think tanks, what, what, what are you going to change tomorrow based on this very important discussion? And by the way, I don't think anything that I heard uh, about what happened during this week is really new or surprising. It was just said very honestly and, and, and courageously. So anybody have any ideas about what it is that we should do? How about this cleavage? How do we move ahead? And what about the think tanks? Any of you, we have a few more minutes. Well, maybe I can start yes, uh, great. Um, in, in terms of, of the internal uh, dynamics in, in Europe. I think for me, there, there are three key axes that really need to be thought through. The first one is uh, the convergence between the different countries of Europe. We need to have a, a discussion about what is the destination and what is the maximum degree of converge of divergence we want we can uh, accept or can live with between European countries. There is now a, a proposal also for a climate social fund, and I think this is a fundamentally new way to approach Europe, where Europe would be potentially directly redistributed funds to the most affected uh, people in Europe. Because there's also a feeling that some countries are actually not taking care of their poorest uh, members. And that is that is causing a problem for the whole of the European uh, uh, construction. And the last element, and that was very much highlighted by the, by the, the ruling of the Karlsruhe uh, uh, court uh, in terms of uh, intergenerational equity 
And I think if we really apply those three principles, those three principles could be also at the heart of what needs to happen more globally. And I think would give us the credibility that if we are doing it and if we're helping others do it, we get to the really the core of the agenda. Because to me, a very big agenda is also the degree of inequality within each southern country. Uh, and also the inequality between different generations in southern countries. And in a way, I feel we, we need to get out of uh, part of the North-South agenda, which is no longer valid because it's hiding differences within countries and between generations. I hope that you're going to work on those issues because it's really getting to the core of the agenda. We don't have much time. And this meeting pointed many of the core issues. Anybody else before I have to close this session, unfortunately? What's Idri going to do tomorrow, Sebastian? Maybe you can get a little sleep, but not too much. Thank you very much, Julia. Yes, uh, of course, we need to process what we've heard. And, and, and I completely agree with you that things we heard are not new, but it's the intensity of, uh, of what we heard that is to me really striking. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I think what's, what's really uh, the, the only thing that I could say is that we will need to find a way to really work much more closely on the external and internal privileges, actually. Uh, to some extent, it's illustrative that we are, we, we, as at IDRI, we have gathered this European think tank group on development that works mostly on development and external action and think sustainable Europe, which is another alliance that works mostly on domestic, but not only uh, sustainability issues. And, and we need to work jointly because those privileges will, will, will not be, uh, we, we will not be able to uh, operate without uh, working jointly on those two types of privileges, internal to the EU and external. Very good. Thank you very much. Osa, do you want to say anything more? You've already said great things. I'm not sure that we've... I don't think that she hears us. Okay. All right. Why don't we stop at this point? Because I think you all need to do a little bit of a technical check. I want to thank you all very much, and I hope we'll meet again and work ha harder than we have even before. So this part of this meeting is over. Thank you, and I'm going to stay on because we need to do this technical check. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julia. Thank you. Hey, bon anniversaire. Bon anniversaire, absolument. We had too little time, but this has to continue. Okay. So good afternoon, and welcome to this panel which is a, a, one of the, 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 it is really the last panel of this meeting. First of all, I want to wish Idri happy 20th birthday and to congratulate Laurence for having had this brilliant idea. So, bon anniversaire, happy birthday to Idri. My name is Julia Martin Lefebvre. I've been asked to coordinate, to moderate this panel. I, I think I'm doing that in this particular capacity because I do, I chair the strategic advisory board to Idri, which is one of my favorite jobs. Uh, uh, not that I don't like being on the bureau of Ibes, Anna Maria, but being with I I Idri, and it was your idea, Laurence, to get me in. And I've long admired Idri, and so I'm delighted to do this. All right, so, so this panel is the last one in this conference intended to hear from our panelists based on their wide experience and current roles and focusing on their views of potential next steps to improve multilateralism and global governance, focusing on the challenge of sustainability. I have to confess, and I know Sebastian knew this, this is an, a, an issue very close to my heart. So we have seen the preliminary results of the discussions that has taken place this week, and clearly there is a lack of trust, there, there are strong feelings on these issues, and we'll come back to this. So let me introduce our panelists. First of all, Laurence Tubiana, who is CEO of the European Climate Foundation, and as I said, founder of IDRI. Unfortunately, we were supposed to have Janes Potocznik, former EU Environmental Commissioner and co-chair of the International Resources Panel. He was with us a few minutes ago. We lost him, but maybe he'll come back. Ana Maria Hernandez, who's chair of the Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. It has a terrible acronym, Ana Maria. And, and I'm a member of her bureau. That's a very important job. And Pascal Lamy, uh, president of the Jacques Delors Institute and the Paris Peace Forum. And all of, all of us and all of you could have many more minutes of introductions. 
So now I'm going to ask each of our panelists, um, unfortunately for only about 10 minutes, to share their ideas and visions with us based on this desire for multilateralism that works and how do they see it. So let me start with you, Laurence. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Julia, everybody, and, and, and really this anniversary for me is a very important success. Uh, as, as you know, I'm no more in the day-to-day -day management of injury, so I, I'm even prouder that this is really developing so well. So, uh, as you have been talking about this week, multilateralism is at a very low point. And of course, compared to a sort of happy days of the 2015 and the context of the Paris Agreement, uh, we, we are in a very, very different situation, of course. <clears throat> there were G20 tension, like we are seeing these, these weeks back then as today, but we, we have, of course, this new factor uh, of the pandemic and the Greek divergence recovery, uh, the terrible numbers of IMF for 95 million more people have, have fallen into extreme poverty in 2020, the vaccine inequity that are really breeding mistrust in diplomatic fora. The US still, of course, hopefully back on the climate scene, but tension with China is a major obstacle to climate action. And it, you cannot compartmentalize all this, and, and in a way, with a vision of U.S., which we know it is always more keen to develop unilateral action, bilateral deals, more than really playing within the global scene. And of course, Afghanistan and Okus are just significant elements in the multilateral system. So this overemphasis of getting bilateral deals done ahead of COP26 for me is a concern where climate vulnerable are more marginalized today than they were in 2015. And it's a concern, and I hope the COP26 will, will show again that this, this, there is a virtue, even if the process is slow and, and has, of course, is deficiencies, that the multilateral system is the only way to have the voice of everybody listened to. And that's getting to a better result at the end. The solution proposed uh, again and, and again and again is the threat of a coalition of the willing approach. I'm not against cloud carbon clubs or, or in a way, in a way, front runners uh, getting together. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, sometimes it is we don't see sometimes uh, finally the, the raising the bar of, of the goals for, in particular, for the provision of the global public good we are looking for. Uh, the carbon border adjustment mechanism has to discuss, uh, and of course that would be important. It has, in a way, positive effect. In a way, you see Russia now, China, very concerned about that. I took recently with Indonesian government members, and, and, they, and they are, of course, seeing that the trade elements that will link certainly climate with other issues is important. That has sparked discussion about these carbon clubs. Uh, and based on this tariff, I, I think at, at that stage, I'm not co I'm not convinced about the compatibility totally with the multilateral spirit of the Paris Agreement. We could we could solve this problem. I'm I'm not against again. I I see a very big value around this discussion about the border adjustment mechanism within, in a way, the discussion with the more the bigger economies and the G20. But I I, I have. I am concerned about preferring that in, in lieu of really trying as well to deal with the global problem. And by the way, you see immediately how the OECD, uh, if you read the last article in the FT, uh, trying to mediate all this tension. So what is the, the trend? We, we have a regionalization of climate action. Uh, and on the other side, I, I don't, um, we can ask Yourself. Is this supporting or hampering multilateralism? I see one interesting development because it's across the board and it's now many, many more, uh, uh, in a way, subject and topics. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at the green financial regulation, for example, and I see that it, in this to converge uh, country by country on bilateral discussion like EU and China, for example, or US, we see that the working hard in the preparation, harmonizing the taxonomy is certainly 
something which is, in my view, positive. Mm -hmm. uh, we see that, for example, the mm -hmm. Chinese Central Bank uh, is now China and EU, EU taxonomy are roughly 80% similar. We have, of course, a discussion on, with the US on that. So mm -hmm. I, I do think this element show, uh, contrary to what I'm saying, sometime we, we need front runners and that could be positive. Mm -hmm. On the other side, I think it's very good to see that at least Europe has tried to incorporate in its own external policy element that is consistent with Paris Agreement goals and, and, and it was the global goals. I'm thinking about in particular for EU New Zealand trade deal, which is really Paris aligned, uh, where for the moment there is some inconsistency when I look at the Mercosur. So mm -hmm. what I'm thinking now, and, and hopefully not being too long, I do, you, you raise, Julia, the point of credibility. Mm -hmm. I think we need that. I, I was unfortunately not uh, listening to previous conversation. I, I do need, we need, a, a, in a way, a Paris Agreement governance 2.0. We, we need a accountability mechanism across the board. Of course, there are, we have some kind, still weak, accountability mechanism for governments, and they, in a way, the pressure is working slowly, but it's working. Whereas we don't have the same for the international system at large, yeah. the private sector, the sanant, etc. So I, I, I think the what I, I I would like us to really launch really a campaign on the what is a, for example as a nickname the true zero. If we want really to be mm -hmm. the net zero scenarios consistent with the International Energy Agency, uh, I think we really have to have a credibility mechanism, regulation, both at national level and, and sort of a, having that across the board. We cannot have maritime sector, aviation sector, uh, banks, mm -hmm. development banks, international financial institution defining their own criteria of alignment with Paris goal. Mm -hmm. And finally, and, and again, my, my second element is we need citizen to take, to, to, to stand up. Uh, we need really, uh, and it's good that the Global Assembly is launched before COP26. Uh, I do think that we need to create a buy-in by citizen of these global public goods and the way these global commons can can their own action. And I do think that participative democracy is maybe a, an element of the rebuilding the trust that citizen doesn't have anymore into their national representative institution, as well as international mm -hmm. ones, knowing the business and investors. So I would say a campaign on honesty, if if I may say so, and a campaign on activism based based mm -hmm. on citizen participation. That would be my two cents, which are not probably not really very limited to, to the discussion. But very, very important. We'll come back to this. Thank you. Thank you very much for this. Let me go and then we'll come back. Uh, let me go to Anna Maria. How do you see it from your point of view? Okay, uh, thank you very much. And first of all, I'm really happy to be here today celebrating the 20th anniversary of Udri uh, and with this fantastic panel. And I want to um, start doing a general comment on mm -hmm. um, this issue of global governance and the multilateralism after a uh, well, um, long time of uh, swimming in these waters. So, mm -hmm. well, first, I don't know if I'm going to present some wishful thinkings and, uh, and sometimes I'm going to be a little punchy, but mm -hmm. we need to maybe take clearly a cl clarity on, on, on all the sessions. The first thing that I want to, to talk about is the leadership. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that, uh, well, um, the global governance, and uh, the better multilateralism needs good leaders from different actors of the international arena. And for that, it is necessary to promote capacities starting from the country levels where the roles of societies are defined according to their respective frames and cultures. And this capacity has to finalize with a better capacity to understand dialogue and cooperate at the multilateral level. And there are different ways and expressions of leadership. And maybe I'm, uh, I, I am going to be a little bit undelicate uh, saying this, but at the multilateral level, a governance which impose only one way to understand the world is <laughs> for saying 
at least is unbalanced. So the mm -hmm. international process of decision making cannot be dominated by those who or speak louder or treats heavier or imposes agendas. Um, I find that the best leadership comes from the capacity to cooperate and co-create the fabric mm -hmm. of, of international relations. And that's the part of maybe a wishful thinking. <laughs> but uh, to do that, the leaders uh, that are guiding the international discussions or the ones that in the future are going to guide the discussions need to have knowledge about the topics of the agendas have to be prepared. And the knowledge does not inc only include the information and data that mm -hmm. is available, but also the capacity to analyze the state of the art and the repercussions of any kind of the decision over uh, under a subject matter that are dis uh, on discussion, not only for the country or organization, but also the, rep the repercussion uh, for others. And um, taking that into consideration, I'm going to uh, talk about the environmental agenda that is indeed where I work since more than two decades ago. And as you know, one relatively new topic in the international agenda from the middle 20th century is uh, well, the topic of environment. And this has been seen as an example of the development of soft law and cooperation. But, um, at, at this point in time, science, evidence, and information are telling us the, the, uh, the urgently need that we have to, 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 to have to move from that, uh, from that way we see the environmental developments. Um, the, uh, all the efforts that the international community have uh, done from the international to regional to national levels regrettably has not been enough to diminish the curve of biodiversity loss, and you know that, or to fight climate change or to reverse degradation and contamination. Um, although we know uh, very well what is happening today and we have the scenarios that show us what could happen if we continue uh, this business as usual? Uh, well, if we do not take real actions, if we do not con uh, are committed to change the way in which we are doing the things, if we do not innovate for sustainable options, well, the result is already in front of our eyes. And we cannot complain. I mean, we know what is going on, resources, scarcity, hunger, illness, alteration in life systems dynamics um, amongst other things and all this generates automatically social ecological economic cultural conflicts in the territories and also in the regions and also between nations and at the multilateral level which this turns in turns affects the security the stability and the peace at national level but also at international level and while we know all that, because I'm, there's nothing of this is new for mm -hmm. any of us, we are really reluctant to address those issues in an integral way at national mm -hmm. or international level. And I think that is, uh, this is one of the very difficult points to break in the multilateralism. Even inside mm -hmm. environmental topics, it is, it is quite difficult to sit together decision yeah. makers from different conventions, organizations, or, 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 or even national focal points to bring joint solutions. For example, mm -hmm. well, it is the case in climate change and biodiversity. Uh, in, 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 uh, in, in some cases, even the national focal points on biodiversity does not know the yeah. national focal points for climate change and the, the, they do not talk together. So the multilateralism today is like a puzzle where the pieces are still disorganized. Maybe some of them already um, make groups, but the, um, we are not able to put together and see the entire picture. Uh, and talk about things such as security or rights or justice at some point in, in their environmental discussion are considered as a political delicate issue and mm -hmm. is generally avoided. Um, and uh, it, these issues together with hunger, poverty or education um, uh, have to be more than a cliche and a political discussions. 
um, those the issues are real dramatic problems. And almost all the countries before taking into consideration sustainability uh, laws, policies, and environment, they are going to address the real problematic issues yeah. for the society, such as mm -hmm. hunger, poverty, etc. Mm -hmm. So, um, all all the things um, are part of what we call indirect drivers of change in relation to biodiversity loss and as we know all that we are again reluctant to address this root causes of uh, each problem the cooperation to combat poverty or hunger or to defend human rights generally has localized effects and it's not enough to create a global impact to turn the wheel so how is the effectiveness of cooperation the sum of the cooperative efforts well is difficult to measure at this point in time and at the end it is really difficult to try to change the face of a worldwide problem um, it is almost impossible if we are not uh, willing to act together from different mm -hmm. parts of the globe north north and south respecting the that really each of the voices have the same way with political will and scientific background to generate and to generate and implement innovations for transforming these drivers of laws into drivers of sustainability Happily, the, the innovative path is starting now uh we we, we are uh, looking uh, right now good examples and we are learning to incorporate in our discussions not only transdisciplinarity which is very important but also cross-sectoral understanding of the problems and possible solutions but still there are concerns and barriers to start the dialogue with actors that are major users of the resources at, at public and private level so one urgent innovation has to be around how we dialogue and interact with uh non-environmentalists -envir so <laughs> thank you and finally we don't change the world with theories about new paradigms, mm -hmm. paradigms, but we can move the world with these ideas toward real actions. The multilateralism needs to change the way in which decides to continue doing more of the same in a way to feel comfortable in reporting back uh, on achievements of goals easily, or if uh, turns decides to turn to a strategic to uh, to do strategic actions and to take pragmatic decisions for solutions and at the end again science and knowledge will show if we are going to be changing the path towards a better future or preferring to put in danger our survival in in the planet so thank you very much and i go back to you julia sorry for thank you no 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 very good very good. I think I just want to say one thing and we'll come back to this. Science and knowledge, unfortunately, is also divided in those silos that you, so, but it's very important. Pascal, over to you, please. How is your view about multilateral collaboration and based on your great experience and how do you see the future? Thank you, Julia. Uh, Greetings to members of the panel. I happen to know them all and to consider them all, including you, as friends. Friends, I hope so. Uh, let me also thanks not only for the invitation, uh, of course, but also for the briefs we got from uh, Sebastian Trayer and the and the Italy staff mm. on the summary of previous discussions during these two days. I found them extremely valuable and extremely interesting, and I will allude to a bit of that. Now, the starting point uh, is uh, very simple. We know we have a big uh, global governance deficit uh, between the problems we have to solve globally and the system uh, we have uh, to do that. Uh, and on top of that, it happened that for the time being, for the reasons uh, which uh, uh, Laurence has given, uh, the system we have is not only not enough for the problems we have, but the system itself is in a very bad shape. 
So the big question uh, in my view, and that's what I want to do in these few minutes, is uh, how can we fix this? Yeah. How can we address this problem? Yeah. My first point, and I only have three points. Uh, my first point is uh, a point uh, I learned with experience. Uh, being uh, for a long time in the machine room and not only on the deck, uh, which is that we should not expect too much from global governance. Uh, this notion that uh, the solution is in a perfect global governance, I don't believe in this because global governance has intrinsic problems that cannot be fixed. And the three of them, and I want to expand on that, the three of them are leadership, accountability, and efficiency. For structural reasons, what we expect from a proper governance system, which are these three elements, are not there in the existing international system. The one we built since uh, 1648 with the Peace of Westphalia, uh, with uh, states, treaties, institutions. Mm -hmm. Leadership, who is the leader? Mm -mm, big question. Accountability, there's nothing like a global accountability. There is a local accountability. There is a national accountability. But there's nothing like a global citizenship, feeling of communality that leads uh, to accountability and I won't have to expand too much on the fact that the international system we have is not efficient. Mm -hmm. The ratio between the resources it used to get things done and what it gets done is a very poor one. No national government, no business, no NGO would survive with such a low ratio of efficiency. So let's put a grain of salt on the notion that all the solutions lie in a better global governance. Now, does this mean uh, there's nothing to be done? Of course not, and that's my second mm -hmm. point. My second point is that there are many areas where we can improve the existing system. This Westphalian state-to-state -state institution organization, the, which, as we all know, the mantra is that they are member-driven. Uh, whether having things driven by members is the right thing to do is another question. But still, there are lots of things we can do to improve this. We can increase the number of treaties, disciplines. The BBNG would be a great thing. A global plastics convention would be a great thing. More diplomatic action on Russia and China uh, so that they accept to surround the Antarctica with marine protected areas would be a great thing. And this is doable within the system, hopefully. We probably, and uh, Laurence already alluded to that, should wonder whether the COP system uh, in climate and uh, in biodiversity is still the right recipe for today. It for sure worked in some instances. But I may have my doubts on whether this is the way to go uh, in the future. Uh, and we can probably, and sorry for entering into logistical details, but we can probably improve nicely the way leaders of international organizations are selected. Uh, a lot of them are where they are because of dirty black uh, out of uh, the public uh, recruitment processes. Uh, we can do much better. Second and third uh, point before I conclude, uh, given these uh, inevitable weaknesses of the inherited Westphalian system, I believe, and I've been working on that for quite a long time, and you've already heard me saying this, that we have to complement multilateralism by what I call polylateralism. Multilateralism is where sovereigns interact. Polylateralism is when international cooperation is much more in the hands of non-sovereign stakeholders. Mm -hmm. NGOs, multinational companies, 
big academic institutions, sub-national entities like cities or regions can do a lot to provide solutions to the global problems we have and which state diplomats, useful as they may be, cannot do. I have a big belief that this is doable. This is the principle which led to the creation of the Paris Reform, uh, which we created in France uh, with uh, Macron in uh, 2018. Uh, we are moving to the fourth edition this, this year. Those of you who are interested uh, to see whether or not polylateralism works better than multilateralism, uh, please join us, have a look at what we do, and make up your mind. It is also, it is also a good way to address a problem which has been identified in the previous discussions on the multilateral system of today, which is this problem of poor power distribution. Mm -hmm. If you work with purpose-led coalitions that may not be permanent, that may be provisional, get to a result and then disband, then the power distribution is much improved. Let me finish with uh, two observations which relate to other debates uh, that uh, have taken place during these days. Uh, Idri has devoted to improving the existing multilateral system. The first one is that, of course, if we want polylateralism to work, not instead of multilateralism, but in order to complement it, we need space for people, businesses, cities to engage. We need more space for voice. And this is absolutely necessary. And this has been recognized, I think, in many of these debates uh, in, the, uh, in the previous uh, days and hours. Uh, so there is a limit to politicization. The limit is when their people have no voice. The limit is in non-democratic system where or authoritarian systems, uh, uh, which where the space for non-state actors to engage is limited. And my second and final remark, which connects, which has one bit said, is that if we look short term, friends, on what we can do to improve multilateralism. There is one thing we can do short term, which is stop the vaccine apartheid we are entertaining on this planet. Mm -hmm. That's the best thing we could do, I think, in one year, maybe 18 months. And I hope that the G20 uh, in Italy uh, will provide for a plan to do that. A number of us, some are <laughs> around this table, I've been working on that for a long time. If we do not do that, forget solidarity, trust, all these nice Sunday speeches about the fact that there is an international community that should do this, this or that. Yeah. That's the thing we need to do if this Idri conversations and days about multilateralism could lead to more pressure on doing this, uh, then I think we could be happy with what we've done. Over to you, Julia. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Lots of things to discuss here. Let me try again, Yanis. <laughs> Dear friends, uh, uh, good to hear you. Unfortunately, Pascal is too many times right, but uh, I will anyway try to stay as much uh, positive and optimistic as possible because optimists, uh, as you know, live longer and better. I have been working on the question of advancing planetary, planetary go governance uh, for, a sustainable for a sustainable future of, for a better part of my professional life. Uh, with Isabella Teixeira, uh, at that time Brazilian Minister for Environment, we actually played an important role in the negotiation of the last major global biodiversity governance agreement. You remember the IG targets. Mm -hmm. uh, a bit more than a decade ago, uh, the sad reality is, of course, that not a lot of agreed has been actually met. Yeah. We are now together co-chairing the UN International Resource Panel and in this capacity decided actually to share experiences and give some guidance for the upcoming biodiversity governance discussions around COP15. 
We did it in the piece called Biodiversity, Building Biodiversity, which can be found on IRP website, to explain the underlying drivers of biodiversity loss and how to tackle them. To summarize the piece in one sentence, we will only succeed if we make biodiversity agreements implementable by accompanying them with commitments and tools to turn around biodiversity loss at its root cause, which is the way we extract and use natural resources. Natural resources use it's not only key for biodiversity negotiation, regeneration, but also it's the essence of the climate change, pollution, global fairness, economic stability. By understanding the way we extract, move, use and reuse and dispose uh, natural resources, we can make a truly systemic approach. Let me quickly explain why natural resource use is so fundamental for planetary crisis we are facing before sharing a perspective of what this means for improving global governance and also for multilateralism. So to my first point, why is changing the way we extract, produce and consume natural resource materials the most systemic way to tackle the biodiversity climate pollution crisis together? The International Resource Panel Global Resource Outlook a few years ago published gave us essential new scientific facts. We learned that half of the global greenhouse gas emissions are caused by the extraction and processing of natural resources. This refers to the extraction of metal ores and their processing into basic materials such as steel. It refers to mining of sand and processing it into products like cement. It also refers to the production of biomass such as food crops and construction woods. Natural resource materials also include the extraction and primary processing of fossil fuels, for example, into heating oil, gasoline, plastics. Formulated a bit simpler, the uh, Global Resource Outlook told us that before even driving our cars, before heating our houses, the production of the materials and fuels for these products has already caused half of the problem. So potentially, even more shocking is that natural resource extraction and processing also cause 90% of land-related global biodiversity loss and water stress, and over one-third of global air pollution. So why it is crucial to connect impacts to natural resource materials and their flows? Making that link is essential to understand the connected economics and behavioral drivers for those impacts. If we only look at where emissions and biodiversity loss are produced directly, we will find that middle and lower income countries cause the major shares. However, if we look at where the ultimate demand for natural resource materials occurs, we can see that most of the impacts are caused by the very inefficient use of resources in high income countries. Most of our planetary crises are caused by mobility systems that are dominated by inefficient private vehicles in rich countries, by urban systems marked by sprawl and inefficient space use and by nutrition patterns that are based on inefficient animal proteins. All of these cause an unnecessary overconsumption of our earth resources. Of course, we should clean up production, for example, with renewable energy, electrification, which is the focus of most environmental policies today. However, that will never be enough and always come with trade-offs if we keep consuming so inefficiently. Mm -hmm. What we need is a system approach which can turn difficult transition needs into big societal opportunities. Only by improving housing, infrastructure, mobility, food system can we strategically improve their societal function, something that is much harder to do when only looking at cleaning up production. In sum, we need to decouple the function of mobility, housing, nutrition, and well-being overall from virgin resource use. In most industrial countries where essential infrastructure is already built and materials can be reused, the decoupling must be absolute. That's clear, meaning that, that this significant decrease in resource use because we are already overshooting planetary boundaries. In low-income countries, essential infrastructure must still be built, so virgin resources are needed, but their use must grow much slower than the increase in well-being. Now, some of you will find this view very intuitive or even obvious, but I can tell you from, again, from long experience, this perspective is far from obvious in most policymakers. If you would 
look at most countries' climate plans, for example, you will find almost exclusively ideas about cleaning energy production, and you will find very few plans for utilizing space in cities more efficiently or reusing materials. And the same we find in global governance, although the post-2020 biodiversity framework shows some promising new perspectives. Therefore, my guiding question for improving global governance and multilateralism in institutions would be, how can we equip global governance to tackle the drivers of unsustainable trends? How can multilateralism support systems that deliver essential societal need with much less virgin resource use? Of course, I will not solve that question in a few minutes which are remaining, but let me try with three quick points. First, the notion of economic success and stability must be directly linked to an economy's performance in sustainable resource use. We have multilateral institutions that are regarded sort of guardians of economic stability, such as IMF or multilateral development and investment banks. These institutions must directly combine their reports on developments in production and consumption, such as the World Economic Outlook, with reporting on resource use and related impacts. We often measure developments in terms of labor productivity, but what about resource productivity? Yeah. Shouldn't we be monitoring and targeting the productivity related to the scarcest input factor? This would be a very reasonable first step that can be implemented immediately with already existing data and analysis. But ultimately, this is my second proposition. We need a new definition and metrics for economic success altogether. Yeah. Measuring economic stability just in terms of economic growth, regardless of the composition of the income, its distribution, or its exploitation of finite resources is a paradox, ignoring the very risks to economic stability even. Many alternative or complementarity indicators to GDP have been explored and partially even tested by countries such as those in the Wellbeing Economy Alliance. What we need now is for those actors closely sticking to GDP, such as international banks, rating agencies, central bank, to dedicate a joint task force, a task force that will commit to finding not only a more integrated matrix, but also to explaining and implementing how institutions can use it and in all decisions make it currently based on GDP only. And third and finally, we need a kind of multilateralism institution that can enable global joint stewardship on natural resources. This refers to the resources that flow through the economy and are inefficiently used, as well as those more abstract resources that are currently being largely ignored offer called ecosystem services. I believe that, that we will need some sort of, um, let me call it global convention for natural resource management, a clear agreement for better transparency, management of materials value chains. Ideally, under such a convention, we would ultimately agree on some level of targets for types and quantities of resource use. But this ideal case does not mean that we must waste decades in discussing a difficult task without agreement, like we did, in, for example, in the climate convention. We should start with more practical protocols, for example, to standardize methods of material flow, scope-free impact accounting, value chain transparency. The institution could provide very practical guidance for how to use such measurement to monitor progress towards climate and biodiversity agreements. Different from the past uh, multilateral agreement, the process to get there would be already half of the benefit to mobilize action along the way, as well as valuable inputs, different levels of government again, including cities, as well as civil society, business could be involved in consistent matter, manner to, ex to, for example, through citizens assembly formats and so on. Naturally, such an inclusive as well a scientifically solid process would need some financial resources. But given the most countries still invest billions into fossil fuel subsidies and certain individuals choose to spend billions on doubtfully useful innovations like space tourism, one would think that financial resources are not actually so scarce, but need to be simply activated in real investment targets. To conclude, for the first time in human history, we actually face the emergence of a single tightly coupled human socio-ecological system of planetary scope, which means that we are more interconnected and interdependent than ever. 
and our individual and also collective responsibility has thus enormously increased. Sharing sovereignty, which means cooperating more, joining is the best and many times only reasonable way to manage our collective future. And our policies response must be guided by science. According to the recent Dasgupta review, our unsustainable engagement with nature can be traced to two things, institutional failure and to the failure of contemporary economics to acknowledge that we are, we humans are embedded with nature and not external to it. So for the beginning, it would be really good to agree that we humans are part of nature and start behaving accordingly. We are terribly indebting future generations, not only financially, also by depleting natural capital. So we should stop giving producers the signals that destroying natural capital is free of charge. And we should stop confusing the consumers by asking them to behave responsibly, but request them to pay more if they do so. I would be the first claiming that nature has intrinsic value. We must respect and protect, but until as nicely put it by Stiglitz, invisible hand will often be invisible since it is often not there. Yeah. This is in the very words of Arto Paselina, a charming mass suicide. So with all those accumulated depths, at minimum what is needed is to leave the future generation generations a better world than the one we live in. So we need not only intergener international agreements, we need seriously an intergenerational agreement. We need more space, uh, as, as uh, Pascal was, was mentioning it before. Obviously, IRP stands ready to engage in and support all those efforts for, uh, as we call it, the future we want. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Janus. Now, we only unfortunately have a few seconds, a uh, few minutes. So I, uh, any of you who want to, come, want to come in, but I just want to say some of the key words here uh, that we you know, the, 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 and not in any order of priority. The, the issue of silos, everything is separated. People don't know each other. They don't, and the whole system structurally was set up like that. What are we going to do about that? Lack of accountability. The participative efforts, and, and Laurence, you have a good experience with what we've tried here in France about that. Leadership, it's missing. Uh, one thing that you really didn't cover, I think, is we don't have time. I think Pascal's su suggestion about the, the vaccine, ending the vaccine apartheid, we could do that. We could do that next week, actually. And that would address the issue of, you know, we're running out of time for all these things. I'm glad you mentioned the Dasgupta report uh, as you were talking about the, the GDP system, which may have worked at another time, but th there are solutions. So what, what would be the, for each of you, just to say a few more words, because Sebastian is going to come back and not be happy with me, but what would you do next? What would be uh, beyond that very good next uh, uh, thing that uh, Pascal suggested about the vaccines, what would you do next? Pascal, I just want to remind you that you and I once worked together on these issues in the Oxford Commission, and we came up with the sunset clauses. That is, some things don't have to be there forever, some organizations. I must say, I am like the participants at this, at this session. I'm a little bit tired of having great statements made by very wise leaders who say, for example, that biodiversity and climate are inextricably linked. That's true. Now, what are we going to do structurally? What are we going to do? We have two COPs. We have two, two uh, IBES and IPCC. How much are they working together? So anybody, uh, Laurence, do you want to start? You were the first. Just a few words. Words. I think uh, I I'm thinking again. Just my bias on, on climate. I think the COPs, as as Pascal said, are you know, hopefully we will finalize uh, any details of the agreement. Uh, this in Glasgow, and then we need uh, to see the system totally differently. Yeah, I think that would be. Uh, we need moments where there is a peer pressure on every direction. The poly um, <coughs> lateralism that. Um, the poly multilateralism that um, Pascal is referring to, and, and the classical one between government. We we have very different sovereign now. Huh? We have uh, even guys who want to control the space. So we need places where I see transparency and accountability work. Mm -hmm. And I would be super happy uh, to have the COP 
uh, integrating all to each other and yeah. oceans in particular as well as biodiversity uh, and then just discuss the problem of the boundary limits where you exert pressure the NGO on the business and vice versa if so I think that could be a governance 2.0 and 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 I, I do think we can go beyond that now uh, be, and we have to install a new system of governance yeah starting as, as, as at least we have to think about that and make proposals so in my view it's we are not a bad system you know uh, many many non-state actors uh, want to be at the table for the moment they don't want still to pay the price which is the clarity and the transparency so it's a good mm -hmm. moment to offer new thinking yeah. and new structure yeah, so new structure. That you come in but then you have a, a, a number of standards and it can be absolutely combined with national regulation so I, I would see that at the moment to start the discussion. Very good. Thank you very much. Pascal, what, what is your last word? Well, two things which I mentioned within the existing system. Another one to complement it. Within the existing system, have a G20 agreement that from now on, leaders of international organizations will be recruited with an open professional system. They have to declare that they are a candidate. They have to mm -hmm. accept to take the risk of not being selected. They have to be heard. They have to be uh, questioned, we need a full normal process of how you select a good leader, whether it's for the bowling club next door or whether it's for General Electric uh, or Dana. So <laughs> I believe this would be a big step forward. Second, uh, help us at the Paris Peace Forum building new coalitions on issues that may not be for the next 20 years, but for the next two, three, five years, yeah. help us moving this forward, help us gathering the necessary speed. We've gained a lot of clout and gain for the last four years, but I believe this is a good way. Most, most of the coalitions which have been successful were driven by young people who mm -hmm. do not know a damn about how the UN Security Council works, or even is something that works reasonably well, which is the Global Fund against uh, HIV and malaria HIV, work, yeah. they work, but they mm -hmm. want to do the thing themselves, and I can mm -hmm. tell you it works. So over yeah. to you. Very good. Thank you very much. Last word. Ana Maria, you were the first person to uh, introduce the term leadership in our discussion, and it's clearly a preoccupation for all of us. So a quick word from you. Yes, uh, quick, uh, quickly. First, I think that instead of more international bureaucracy, we need to improve implementation and the leadership mm. there is definitely needed. Yes, uh, the, the leaders that are going to be seated in the multilateral arena are, have to be also leaders at national level. And um, I, I, I want to take back um, the, the political silos that we, you were talking mm -hmm. about and we were talking about. You were. Um, because, and I was. <laughs> because All of you. At, at, uh, as, uh, at, at scientific level, as you know, the researchers are doing a great job working together and uh, doing this interlinkages between knowledge on climate uh, sciences on uh, the, the, uh, the certification biodiversity mm. oceans etc the problem is that political silos are so selfish mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the multilateralism as it is right now it is is too hard in the structure that does not allow the political <laughs> people to talk together so I think that the way to move forward, and I, I, I have to recall that I don't know when, maybe 15 or 10 years ago, we did a fantastic exercise between the subsa of the CVD and the substa of the Convention on Climate Change. Climate. And we had 
uh, 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 joined a meeting uh, yes. between mm -hmm. the decision makers. So I, I, mm -hmm. I think that we can have that kind of spaces in the actual multilateralism to start to make decisions or, or to, to take conversations in the political level. Uh, so, the, but we need leadership to call yeah. this yeah. Uh, to come together. Yeah, thank you very much. So, uh, last word then to Yanez. And I'm very glad you brought up the GDP issue, how to measure wealth, not to count the number of acres of hectares of forests a country has, for example, and protected areas is just unbelievable to me. So last word. Yeah, thank you. Two issues. Uh, the first one is now practically everybody already speaks that we have to connect the biodiversity mm -hmm. and climate. Don't yeah. do the same mistake again. It's not about connecting biodiversity and climate. It's about mm -hmm. connecting all the environmental impacts together exactly. because they have the same drivers and pressures. So mm -hmm. when you talk about pollution, when you talk about health implications, everything goes back to the economic activities, only the structure of economic activities which influence biodiversity, climate, uh, pollution, it's a bit different. But mm -hmm. the drivers are the same. So address the drivers and you will get multiple benefits in all the fora which are happening there in climate, biodiversity, pollution, health. So that's the first point. The, and the second is, if you want a very concrete, uh, uh, concrete proposal, yes. It was revealed uh, during the G7 meeting in the UK this year that still in 2020 and mm. till, if I remember well, till March 2021, the data were 2020 till March 21, the G7 countries are giving more state subsidies for fossil fuels than actually for yeah. renewable energy. So none of the countries which is giving more state subsidies nowadays should not have the seat in Glasgow, full stop. Mm -hmm. Yes, very good, very good point, very good point. So I think I was given very strict instructions to stop at, seven, at uh, 640, which it is, but I don't know whether, uh, Sebastian, you're back. Good, you get the last word on your 20th anniversary. You've got your founder with us. We've had a great conversation. I don't know if you were with us, but I can help you summarize it. Lots of good ideas, a great panel. Last word to you and thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Julia, and thank you, Laurence, Anna Maria, Pascal, uh, Jan, for, for this very interesting panel. Actually, the idea that I have now after having listened to you about who can exert leadership, the role of civil society, and the importance of uh, listening to younger people who are actually asking for changes, is that I would give the floor to those young uh, activists from civil society, from African countries who have been participating from the beginning to this conference. And I, in this regard, I'm really happy that we have with us Chibeze Ezekiel, the executive director of uh, the Strategic Youth Network for Development from Ghana, and Fatimou Balama, founder and executive director of Aid Profen in Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, I will just ask a, a question to Chibeze, and Chief Sobejvar from Sciences Po will ask a question to Passi as a way Great. to really come to a close. Uh, so, thanks a lot, Chibese. I hope you can hear us. I know that it's not always easy to be connected and that sometimes power is lacking or internet connection. But I would ask you, uh, as a civil society activist working in your country for the transformation to sustainability, what are for you the main ideas and suggestions that you retain from the conference? And what is it that you need from global, from global governance? Uh, and if you have some message for European players, what they can do in particular? So Shibeze, I don't know. I hope you can hear me. Uh, and if you can, please uh, go ahead. I'm not sure that Shibeze is with us, actually. I don't see Shibeze. Hi, Sebastian. Shibeze is with us, but he will join us in three seconds. Three seconds. He just has a, a small a small technical problem that he, he will join us. And so I see she's and Passy. Uh, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. I, I, in the meantime, really thanking a lot, uh, Julia, for, for chairing the, the last panel. And I know that you have a very busy, uh, a very busy time, but it would be interesting. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
please, the floor is yours, Chibuze. Thanks again for being with us again. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sebastian. And um, once again, thank you for the opportunity. Um, it was a great privilege to be part of this session. And um, having heard from all the conversations and discussions, um, I want to just share a few thoughts from our side. Um, just on the three key questions that you asked me, uh, the first one is about the kind of changes that is needed in the global governance architecture. Um, as a CSO actor, I will say that one, what we need to change or hold daily to, is to still hold strongly to the leaving no one behind uh, mantra as part of the Agenda 2030 mechanism. Uh, when I think about leave no one behind, I'm talking about young people, the old people, people with disability, the minority, everybody must be carried along. So we need that, you know, double, uh, one effort to ensure that nobody is left behind in that particular process. Again, I also want to propose that as part of the changes, we should open up the space for CSO's um, contribution or engagement um, in some of this uh, multilateral system. Um, because over the period, we've seen that the work of CSOs keep, or their space keep shrinking. But <coughs> the need to open up a space for CSOs to engage more. And also as an environmentalist, um, I purposely want to say that we must support young climate activists uh, to push the agenda. And we are talking about so environmental sustainability and protecting our ecosystem. And for that matter, when we talk about good governance or multilateral system, let's not lose the fact that we must preserve and support all young climate activists because whatever campaign we do, our advocacy basically is towards the uh, protection of our environment. And, and in terms of what is feasible and that who uh, are those who can make those necessary move, um, I mean, broadly, I would say that the policymakers and the decision makers. But if I want to unpack that, I'm talking about the political leaders, the technocrats, the CSOs, the private sector, we all have a role to play. So that choice must not be must not be only on one stakeholder, but everybody must be must come together and agree that the change we need is feasible. And therefore the views and comment of every stakeholder is equally important. So I think that that that's the, the governance we are talking about is feasible. And then finally, uh, in terms of my message for the European players, be it government, uh, CSO, the private sector, um, one of the key things that has come out of these discussions or conversations is about the issue for justice, fairness, respect, and voice for the voiceless. When it comes to justice, I want to narrow down to climate justice. And that's what we are asking from the Global South, that those who are the perpetrators or those who are causing climate change must provide more resources as we make effort to fight climate change. So we need justice uh, in all sectors or all spheres of life. And also there must be fairness in terms of equity, uh, in terms of resource distribution. And that those who need more resources to advance must be giving those support they need for them to grow. One key example is that uh, when it comes to advancement, Africa needs technology. So one key example is to give them some those kind of support in the name of technological transfer so they can also grow the economy and expand. And then finally, also, um, consciously, let's give a voice to the voiceless. So the European players want to encourage them to support all these minority groups, the people with disability, the youth groups, the elderly, so they can also have their voices heard in this architecture. And I believe that once all these things are done, it will help us to attain the kind of system we want to see from the multilateral uh, governance process that we are talking about. So basically, those will just be my few words that I want to share as part of my concluding remarks. Thank you for the opportunity once again. Thank you so much, it is a very important. She wants to ask a question to Passy. Okay. Uh, yes, for sure. I'd also like to kind of just contextualize so that uh, uh, Passy understands where I'm kind of coming from, because this shouldn't be seen as coming from kind of left field, uh, because I've, I found uh, the conference kind of wonderful, lively at times, and very thoughtful. I know the last uh, three days, uh, Clarion call on two central messages. One is governance or sustainability needs to be, must remain a multilateral effort, but organized around institutions, not just at the global international, but very much involving the local and the national. So that's one. And I'd like to have kind of uh, pass his reflections on that. And the second is existing governance arrangements have been found severely wanting despite promises, and to be fair, maybe because primarily uh, sustainable development was not the founding mission. But what I found kind of interesting was in the conference, the ideas on the how to, the what was very rich, 
we had lots of interesting ideas on the what what to do, but on the how to were more sparse. And I'm not sure if Passy also feels uh, ha has the same sense because it's clear when when history is very clear that power is to be arrested uh, and is never handed. How do we use a solidarity and knowledge that we have collectively have of what needs to be done towards the end we collectively seek? I'd like to know what are kind of uh, Passy's uh, kind of thoughts on both of these questions. Thank you, Shiv. This question. Uh, I think on my side, what needs to change uh, in the global governance? Um, I think first we need to decolonize uh, global co uh, cooperation and uh, global governance. Uh, because for me, the, the global governance is to provide the global public good, uh, particularly peace and security. And when I talk about peace and security, I see also justice, accountability, and transparency. And I, I will give a small example of, of a woman I've met in Masisi. Masisi is a territory in North Kivu. And that woman uh, was living in an IDP camp, a displaced population uh, camp. And I've asked her a question, what was the most important thing uh, she needs in the camp? You know, her answer was uh, just to get peace and security in her village so that she can return home and take care of her family. And, you know, uh, for her, the, the most important thing was not money or food, you know, all those uh, stuffs, but to get peace and security. And I think uh, for people globally, that is the most important thing we are, we, we are um, in the global cooperation that is very important. Uh, I will also talk about um, natural resources. So the DRC, we have resources, and there are so many bilateralists who are uh, currently exploiting resources, not only in the DRC, but in other African countries. And still, for me, a huge contrast between uh, the resources which are coming from those mining sites and the poverty in which people are living in those uh, different countries. And for me, that is uh, just unacceptable. I think I, I want here to emphasize on accountability and transparency. I, I think when we are talking about cooperation, uh, cooperation for me means also um, the two words. Uh, transparency and cooperation. And we also have to our role and responsibility in what is uh, going on uh, on this planet. Um, the, the climate change, for example, in the DRC, we have like the largest, uh, one of the most large uh, forests in the world. And um, I know Europe have been developed because they have been, you know, exploiting uh, their resources. But in the DRC, they, uh, we have been exploited because, you know, we have to protect environment and, you know. Uh, but all those people who live uh, around the Virunga mm -hmm. National Park, for example, you know, those people are really suffering and depend on uh, I think we, we need to ask the question about how we can that can get uh, a, a good life um, in exchange of what they have done um, for. for. Uh, when we talk about responsibility, I think the nation which is very important. Well, different countries, uh, and there are so many decisions which are taking over. In the DRC, we have 
a United Nations uh, country, but you know, people and the poverty poor are still suffering. Think for uh, the leader in the world, uh, we need to think about our role and responsibility. I, I think there are so many mistakes who have been uh, done in the past, and we need to avoid to avoid uh, those mistakes um, now and the narrative uh, of the cooperation and the global uh, governance by reviewing our role and responsibility. Uh, I, I think this is like uh, the big message I want to provide. Thank you again uh, to IDRI for this opportunity and for this conference, which is very important uh, to um, strengthen uh, the global and this um, cooperation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Shiv. I know she had very little time to conclude, and I think we need to just come to a final close. Um, uh, and I think the, the only word that I want to say is happy birthday, Idri, and I'm really proud to say that in front of Florence, who has founded Idri 20 years ago. Uh, happy birthday, Idri. Thanks to all the, the, the friends uh, and person, eminent personalities who have participated to the three, uh, this marathon of three days. Uh, from all over the world, and I think that was really counting a lot for us at Tidri that we were able, thanks to the video conference devices, to have people from everywhere and to have European players discuss with other regions and see how divided we might be and how uh, shared, uh, how we nevertheless are going to be able to build a shared, shared future. My last words are to say thank you very much to all the the whole team of Idri, who has been extremely uh, working extremely hard collectively to make that happen, particularly our communications team, who are behind the scenes doing lots of things to, for instance, be able to have Yanesh uh, speak in this last panel. And I'm very sorry again, Mr. Potashnik, for all the trouble that you had. But thanks you a lot, Karine, Aurore, Louis, Diraj, all the teams who have been working so much on that. I wish we have time at some point to uh, raise our glass together to really uh, finalize this happy birthday to Idri. And thanks a lot for Shiv and, and the Sciences Po team to have uh, co-organized this uh, event with us. This is now over and I regret it because it's been a really interesting three days. Thank you very much. Uh, hope to see, you'll hear from us soon uh, in an organizer's synthesis of what we've taken up from this uh, very important conference. Thank you, Thank you very much, Sebastian. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all.